This program was recorded on Monday, October 19th, in the year of our Lord, 2015. The opinions expressed by the participants in the following program do not necessarily represent that of this station or its management. From the John DeVita Recording Studio, located in an undisclosed and clandestine location on the great northwest side of our fair city of Chicago, we once again are pleased to be presenting yet another edition of our monthly roundtable panel discussion show, Meet the Chicago Historians. And now here's the guy who started it all, John DeVita. Well, thank you very much, Rich, and from the John DeVita Broadcast Center, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another broadcast of Meet the Chicago Historians on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, October the 19th, the year of our Lord, 2015. Today the panel will be talking about folk, pop, jazz, big band, and orchestra hall, and all the ballrooms, music in Chicago. So sit back and enjoy Meet the Chicago Historians. And now to start today's broadcast, here's our announcer, Mr. Richard Lang. And now here's our panel moderator, Jack Red Ryan. Jack? This is... This is where the book passing stops. I just made that one up. Who? This is where the book passing stops. Good afternoon. You good pass afternoon. the buck over there on Fourth uh, Third Drive, don't you? Yeah, yeah, something <laughs> like that. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Beautiful October day. We're in the uh, the midst of a mid autumn uh, renaissance. Beautiful weather and uh, beautiful football weather, right? Mm. Right. <laughs> Speaking of sports, now we got to talk a little. We always Get a little bit of usually get a little bit on the uh, contem you know te contemporary news or the contemporary events or as we call it for, uh, history as they say on the History Channel history made fresh every day well that's our current events and we we'll start with sports anyway and uh, we see now the Cubs have made it to the uh, NLCS but now they lost two in a row now anybody here a Cub fan yeah, yeah. sort of maybe not a Cub fan but I'm Still like to see him get in and win. I mean, I understand. Yeah. You know, if you get a new car, does that hurt me? You know, that's the way I look at it. Hmm. I can't get enthused about it, but. But if the Cubs get a new car, does that hurt you? That's all of them? Or one? Well, I'll, for for the, any Cub fans that are listening, I'll give you my two favorite uh, lines. My mother always told myself and my brothers that if you get married, marry a Cub fan. Because anyone that can back a loser like that for all those years won't have any problem with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, you know, they. Oh, I, think, I think it was George Will that said any club can have a bad century. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, actually, they were in, they were in the World Series quite a bit. Uh, well, if you look over the years, they back, just didn't. Back when, back not when, too when William Howard. No, but I mean, they, they were <laughs> quite a bit, but they never won anything. 1908. Come yeah. on now. <laughs> as recently as 1908. Yeah. Uh, 1907, they won. 1906, they lost to the Hitless Wonders. The, the White Sox. The, and the, the last time they won the World Series, Roosevelt was president. Theodore, Teddy, yeah. Theodore <laughs> Roosevelt. <laughs> That's right. That's true. Yeah, they put the uh, Cub jersey and the dinosaur outside the Field Museum, and they said the reason they did that is because the last time the Cubs won the World Series, that thing was alive. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it was the team mascot. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's ironic that they're playing the Mets, too, isn't it, in this yeah. uh, series? And, uh, as we all recall, of course... All of us sitting around here, all we graybeards, remember like the 69 season, which was, well, one team took a die, a nose dive, the other team got hot, and we know which was which. Mm -hmm. and that's, of course, what a, what, a, what a pitching staff they had at the other time. They had uh, Tom Seaver, uh, Nolan Ryan. Tom Terrific. Cousin, Jerry Kuzman. I wasn't paying any attention. I got married that year. <laughs> you got married? What'd you do that for? I don't have no idea. Well, I see. No World Series in Chicago. Get married. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And the Cubs had the great Leo DeRocher as their oh, manager. No. And that was That's the, right. He injected some incitement, excitement into the North Side. It was the first time the Cubs had been <coughs> an exciting team in a long, long time. He was, Well, he was He was exciting. Right, one thing you got to admit about the Cubs, though, they always got a sold-out uh, ball game. Because uh, people go there and see them 10 o'clock in the morning on the bus going down there. Mm -hmm. right? 
Yeah, their attendance is way up again this year. Last year it was way off. Uh, Still not bad, though, right? Of course. You know, it's hard to get enthusiastic about a team that is in last place from the <laughs> entire season. Well, Maybe that has something to do with the attendance. What's incredible is that movie, Back to the Future, that they predicted in, what, in October of 2015 that the Cubs had just won the World Series. Right. Yeah, did they? If, if it were to come to pass, that's going to be just an incredible hit. Hmm. Yes. If the Cubs make it this year, they'll really be pointing that forecast in Back to the Future. And the movie, that was made in the 1980s, that's I right, believe. That's right, 85. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, 2015 was really the future. Yeah. Though, 30 years. Yeah. Well, plus, uh, it's the, the old adage, if you predict something long enough, eventually <laughs> it will come true. Yeah. <laughs> right. not even a stopped clock is right, right. twice a day. That's but right. that is strange that it would be 2015 when they would say it like that. No, but I'm, I'm glad they're, they're where they're at, and I hope they win. I yep. hope they go all the way. It's great for yeah. the city of Chicago and uh, great for baseball. Oh, you're always talking about pro uh, prognosticators. Uh, there's always these guys out there that said uh, the stock market's got to go down, the stock market's got to go down 10 years later. See, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Well, somebody said that, that the experts on Wall Street had predicted 10 of the last 20 downturns in the economy. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's 500. They're betting 500, aren't they? Good batting average, but <laughs> yeah, but not a very good prediction. Really. The fellow who's the star of of that uh, Back to the Future yeah, film, you, whose name is I, I never seen. I've I've never seen those films, but he he wants to throw out the first pitch at one of the yeah, World Chris, Series. Games. Christopher Lloyd. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. No. Oh, you mean Reverend Jim from the Taxi? Yeah, that's yeah, him. That's, that's right. Him. That's right. He was also well. He'd been around funny, but uh, interesting. The Mets, though, I've got to point out. If you look at my jacket here. What a what a tie in they had with the White Sox. They had Al Weiss from the Sox, uh, J C Martin, and who was the other one? They oh Tommy Tommy Agee. All those all those three guys were, were very much uh, part of that team. That was their first pennant, wasn't it? Yeah, in sixty nine. Yeah. But they started in like sixty two. Yeah, right. they were the they were the lovable losers all through the sixties. But they were packing them in. Yeah. Why? Casey Stengel. No, <laughs> I think it was because they the city had lost two National League clubs and all these. People who felt like they were mm -hmm. caught on were giving them a chance. A they took yeah. do Dodger blue and they took the orange from the Giants, like that. So, mm -hmm. how do we get on that now? <laughs> we, we digress. What about anything? Uh, anything? You know, every every New York team has played in a different borough. The Yankees mm. are in the Bronx. <coughs> the Giants were in Manhattan. Brooklyn, the Dodgers, of course, in Brooklyn, and the Mets are in Queens. So they've never, they've always, they've always spaced it out amongst the five boroughs of New York. Well, the Yankees started, and they used to share the polo grounds right, originally. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. they, they were the New York Highlanders when they went <laughs> to New York. Yeah. They started out, they started out life as the Baltimore Orioles. They had the team, the name they moved after a couple of seasons or whatever, and uh, then the names get recycled. There were Baltimore Orioles in the American Association, National League, whatever, mm -hmm. you know. So the Dodgers were known as the Trolley Dodgers. Trolley Dodgers, right. There so many trolleys yeah. going through Brooklyn that they said you had to dodge them if you could get across the street. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and, and, uh, and related to that story, I see Vince Scully has signed on for next season. <laughs> How many? 67 seasons or something like that he's done? The Dodgers. Did he broadcast the last Cubs World Series when they won in 1908? <laughs> was, he, was he in the booth? For, for the <laughs> oh. They've done that with smoke signals, right? <laughs> Didn't have a radio yet, did no. they? And Television, no. yes. Radio, no. No radio. And, no. and speaking of signing, uh, nothing's being said about the certain radio station that let the Cubs go sign with a new radio station this year because they were losing for all those years. Yeah. I mean, like World's Greatest Newspaper? Yeah. Uh, it could, yeah, could be it, yeah. WGN yeah. was synonymous with the Cubs yeah. for decades. And yeah, decades. Yeah. Yeah. That, that would be ironic if they win the World Series the first, first year <laughs> well, after WGN <coughs> cuts them <laughs> loose. <laughs> GN used to have the Bears and the Cubs, remember? Yeah. 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 And the Sox. They would do them all. Yeah, well, on the television. Yeah. Well, that's right, Jack. Brick, brick. Yeah. Dat, dat's yeah. No, you got to get it. It's that's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Here's some scores. The Los Angeles Lambs beat the Baltimore Orioles. <laughs> But well, anyway, <laughs> we're talking about, we're kidding Irv Cups in it, I know, right now. So, uh, Ir Irv was a pretty busy guy, though. They said he used to fall asleep up there between comment comments. And, uh, so, mm. he played football, too. He was a quarterback at Northwestern and got into a fight or something, so he had to go to North Dakota huh. to go finish college. He played one year for Philadelphia Eagles. He was a sports writer originally. 
He also double dipped. Irv, you double dipped that time. He officiated that big game with the uh, between the Skins and Washington Redskins and the Bears. The championship NF was 1940. Now, if, if he went to North Dakota, did he wear a jacket with ND on it so that people would think he went to Notre Dame? <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing doing it, man. <laughs> but uh, the, Red, the Redskins are in trouble too because of the name. Oh, oh isn't that, that silly! Isn't that the silliest damn thing you ever heard? Yeah, well, I mean, especially with all the other, you've got the Chiefs and the Blackhawks yeah. and the and well, the Indians, Indians. R- right? Well, well the Indians Black were... Blackhawks contribute quite a bit of money to the uh, Indian cause, from what I understand. So they're sort of bypass extortion. <laughs> well, you want to call I know, it. I know the. Uh, but, uh, but the you know how the name Redskin came around, don't you? Not exactly. No, hey, I'm uh, uh, fr- uh, uh, hey, uh, no, uh, no, no, uh, no, uh, no, uh, no. The one tribe put red. Paint on their face? No, it was red ochre. Ochre. Well, okay. <coughs> well, essentially red paint. Yes. Yeah, well, you know, painted the face. So. Well, well I, I, the the Seminoles, when they created that controversy in Florida with the Florida State, uh, the Seminole, the chief of the Seminole tribe said, "We loved the mm-hmm. name. It's, uh, we consider it an honor." Yeah. Right. What are you talking about? The state of California has passed legislation banning the the word Redskins from any oh. high school or college. Football mm-hmm. a team of any kind in the state of California. No. Yeah, they got to get, get carried away with this. Uh, yeah, but we can have we can have homosexual marriage, by, abortion, abortion on demand. Teams what else in California that had the name Redskins? Oh, right? And now they've got a state law forbidding yeah. them. They, they, they get carried away. I, with I, it. I don't know if uh, maybe the First Amendment doesn't apply in the state of California. The, uh, they also uh, recent law passed banning chewing tobacco in the ballparks and all that. I don't know any ball players chewed tobacco anymore. Hmm. <clears throat> Look, next thing will be bubblegum. Bubblegum will be next. You watch. Uh, no bubbles. Has anybody here seen bubbles? No, they, they, they can't shoot bubblegum because they spit it on the the, the base. They're going to have to get stuck On the it. ball. <laughs> now it's sunflower seeds. <laughs> oh, unbelievable. <laughs> you know, is this a crazy world or what? I mean, uh, yeah. everything well, that's going on. But, yeah, the uh, it, it's it's... Well, the the other thing is the Canadians have to be politically correct. Now they call them the First Nation, and I don't understand where the First Nation bit came in because the fact is that they migrated south, and there are so <laughs> many different nations up there. So how many First Nations do you have? I have always objected to this concept of Native Americans. Mm-hmm. I assume every one of us at this table is a Native American. Every, anyone here. who is born in the United States of America is a Native American. If you're born of yeah. American parents and in the and within the territory, then you're a Native-born American. The idea that 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 they are, they exclusively are Native Americans, and you see this now when you're watching television, when when they give you the description of of the movie, you know, John Wayne goes up against a tribe of Native Americans. <laughs> It, it's, it looks ridiculous yeah. when you see it yeah. printed out in that way about these Western films. Yeah, it's called the American Indian Movement, the one group. So, yeah. well, They don't even want to be called Indians, but Indians in general. We had, we had one guy down here who basically liked to be called by their tribal name first. Or we had our one guest, I can't think of his name now, from the center, yeah. remember? A couple of years back. Were you here? I mean, I wasn't here that time. No. But they, they like to be called by their their tribal name first you know in other words that they're well, look at a, look at all the colleges and universities that have banned the uh, term illegal immigrant you can't say illegal immigrant oh, no, they're undocumented right yeah. well I th- I'm suggesting trust- the police departments refer to burglars as guest residents yeah. Yeah. <laughs> illegal, I thought they were called undocumented, undocumented right. visitors I right. thought they were called trespassers yeah. mm. No, no, that's that's too. If you rob a bank, you're an undocumented with you know an undocumented withdrawal. Uh, (laughs) Or they'll call someone out burning, (coughs) looting. Those are demonstrators. Yeah, burning, looting, plundering. What else are they doing? You know, on on more than one occasion, I've had people ask me how I can play a song. How can you play that song? Being on the accordion, I say, well, I put my finger on the (laughs) key, and in this hand. The left hand, it pulls the bellows, and that makes the sound on the note. Mm-hmm. And they walk away mad. My drummer starts laughing. You know what they were talking about, don't you? What's I says, no? yeah, we just played Too Fat Polka. What was that? Too Fat Polka. Oh, my God. And somebody was offended. I was that. I mean, I'm, I'm offended by that. <laughs> <laughs> You're not fat. The, o- the other question Yet. is uh, Latino. You realize that half of Europe was Latino? <laughs> 
If you take it to mean Latin, yeah. None right. of it's Latin. Yeah, None of them are Latino. There are there are no Hispanic. There are very few Hispanics in the United States. Mm. According to the current political correctness, mm. Spaniards are not Hispanic. Hispanics, right? Exactly. If you are a native-born, if you're a Castilian, if you're a native-born so Spaniard, Spaniard, you are not Hispanic. They're not Hispanic. Hispanic means these, I guess, mm. these Spanish-speaking countries. Spania, you don't come from Spania, right? Yeah. You come I'll, from where? Oh. I'll have you know, the first Ryan was a Spaniard. It's just, it's just like, it's just like saying that. Uh, Arabs are anti-Semitic when they're Semites. They're Semites, huh? Mm -hmm. The term has been somewhat co-opted, or given a narrower meeting. Anyway, let's have a little roll call here while we're in a the good warm-up session. Yo. Uh, okay. uh, which way should we go? Left to right, right to left, or right down the middle? Right down the middle. <laughs> right down the middle? Line up alphabetically <laughs> according to height. Okay, right ahead of me I have a little fire engine and some kind of electrical device. There's a styrofoam cup, a clipboard. Headphones set. Nobody's wearing headphones today. If it was colder down here, we'd all be wearing them, right? Right? Yeah. Okay, we have uh, a couple of people sitting with us today. Should we go? Guest stars are mentioned always in the last is an honor. So we'll start right to the right. Tom McKenna. Guest star. Tom McKenna, retired Chicago police officer, lifelong friend of our moderator, John Jack Ryan, and, and uh, one of the few, few people that actually admit to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Name's Al Opitz. I'm retired from the city of Chicago. I used to uh, have uh, the Austin Urban Community Council. I was president, and uh, I was a, a student of Ken Littles, who's not here today. Great guy. I'm your announcer, Rich Lang, also a student of Ken Littles. Besides his focus on Chicago and neighborhood history, I've done some teaching of modern European and American history. And I'm really involved now with a group, the Norwich, those were the days radio players that recreates old-time radio shows. Are you coming, coming up soon? Or? We'll be at uh, Mathers on Higgins in early December. Mm -hmm. What are you going to be recreating? Not quite sure. It'll be Christmas. It'll be a Christmas yeah. design show. Yeah. How about uh, baby, my ba friend Irma baby Snooks? We we'll <laughs> do that. <laughs> do that? Yeah. I don't do Baby Snooks. No, no I didn't think so. It, right. No. Well, anyway, uh, you should have uh, White Christmas. You can open the doors. We should have some. Is there? Uh, um, uh, can do the cinnamon bear. All the chapters. Now, is there a website or something people can? Uh, look they don't to? have a website. You just have to. <coughs> oh, what? Everybody's got a website. Visit any uh, Mather <coughs> Senior Center or most any church with a senior group, and they'll know of us. Mm -hmm. In the Great Northwest Side of Chicago. And this is when early? You say early December. You're not sure of the date yet. December 4th. 4th, oh. Yeah. In That's the a holy day, isn't it? Late afternoon <laughs> at Mathers on Higgins, near Harlem and Higgins. And to my left, John Koshelko. I'm John S. Koshelko. I was with the town of Cicero. I was a state representative. <coughs> I do a lot of public speaking. And I understand that when Ken Little teaches the early history of the city of Chicago, he talks about the Potawatomi Indians, DuSable, Kinsey, and the last Cubs World Series appearance. <laughs> Oh. Hmm. Okay. That, 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 oh. Next, Ron Smolin is sitting in today. Are, are you a full-fledged member here yet? Or I know he's. You're, you are. Yes. Okay. Well, then I don't have to be so nice to you then, right? No. No. Uh, it's you're, like you're, you're also are. you're a, a member of the the uh, panel on our Chicago Junction Railroad show. Yes. And you're also band leader, band accordion player, or, or, or orchestra director. Yes. And what's the name of your group? The Ron Smolin Orchestra. And you have a website? Yes, ronsmolinorchestra.com. <laughs> okay. Good. And we have a guest, Steve Cooper. <laughs> Thank you. And you're, 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 you're a music man also? Yes, I am. Would you like my 90-second biography? Sure, let's hear it. Okay. Take a little longer, will you? We're going to fill up uh, some more I time. went to Lane Tech High School in the 60s, and everywhere I go, when I mention Lane Tech, I always meet one person in the room who goes to Lane. Are any of you from Lane? Were you from Lane? 57. 57. A little before my time, but not not much. Well, what, what, year, what year did you graduate? I graduated in 65. Hmm. Oh, you're a young guy. So. <laughs> who, was your, who was your principal, Mr. R Dr. Racky or someone? Uh, no, uh, before that, uh, Arthur P. O'Mara. Yeah. And it's politically incorrect to tell you the nickname everybody gave him. So, yeah. <laughs> mm. also, I'm not going to mention also it. Also, you can't say it, right? <laughs> it's a little green thing see. that's four letters long that uh, yeah. hops. But uh, anyway, went to Lane Tech, played my first band job in 1963. 
And uh, when we were 15 years old, we played at the Como Inn. A lot of you remember the Como Inn restaurant. Oh, yeah. And the owner liked us so much, he hired us. We became the house band for the next 17 years, playing all their private parties. And we played for a lot of people, famous people. And it's funny, the only two people I can remember, the famous people we played for, was Harry Carey and Jack Brickhouse. <laughs> I don't mm. know why I remember that. So uh, I played with some famous bands then, and I became a music teacher. I taught for 30 years, junior high school band, and I would often work 70 to 80 to 90 hours a week for very low pay, and teachers get paid a lot more now. It's a lo lot better. And uh, 1980, I got in with Stanley Paul, one of the top high society bands. We played 200 jobs a year, played in the Oprah show, and a lot of big famous parties. We played for the Walgreens Daughters Wedding, and all kinds of things it was unbelievable the music we will talk about it later the music business now is not what it was uh, 20 and 30 40 teach? years ago i taught in harvey illinois for a few years when they had all the factories greatest little town oh it's most wonderful people and then i taught in burridge and dairy and those are the western suburbs mm -hmm. and uh so during during my school time at lane uh, in summer school we'd have summer school band over at lakeview and over at mather Amundsen and Lane Tech, so I got the friends, and we're all still, 40 years later, 50 years later, we're all still friends, we see each other, we go to each other's reunions, and it's just great, you know, and uh, we still all like to talk about the old days of Chicago. Well, Tom McKenna was a, a, a musician and uh, with St. Rita High School Band, where we both graduated. Yeah, I started at uh, St. Rita, and then went on to DePaul in their band, the, uh, some of the famous people, the group Chicago, were all DePaul, DePaul music major guys and then when I went on the police department we had a drum and bugle corps so I played with them for uh, 16 years and then the Emerald Society bagpipe band I played with them for 10 years Wow! and then the uh, we founded the pipes and drums the Chicago Police Department which was all Chicago police officers I was one of the founding members of that group and I also play with the uh, Shannon Rovers Irish bagpipe band so I've been playing for 55 years I tell people I'm going to keep on doing it till I get it right. <laughs> uh, sound like a doctor. Yeah, DePaul had some of the greatest musicians. I mean, yeah, DePaul and Roosevelt were the two. Doctor Tom Fabish. Oh, Fabish. Yeah, he was head of their music department. Well, Lou Ritchie was band director at St. Rita when you were yeah, there. Yeah, right. He was a DePaul DePaul guy. He was also he? taught at Kennedy High School. Well, he was a St. Rita guy too, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I got a nephew and a sister-in-law that work at DePaul. He's a professor, some kind of other. I don't. <laughs> uh, I have zero musical training. I wish I did. I can probably play a kazoo or something like that, or, right? No. How about uh, you, John? I mean, John Kishelko, you the fife. Uh, no, I've never played a musical instrument. No. Hmm. No. Anybody else? No. no. Rich. Just a little piano. Um, piano? You play piano? Never stayed with it. A little piano. Just a little piano. Well, no, it's a grand piano. Never playing on it. Never playing on it. Yeah, the one's about <laughs> toy piano. Oh, a little. 18 yeah. inches wide. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> See, he's, our guys are too modest, I'm telling you. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, folks, these are the most modest people. <laughs> In my own case, I don't have a lot to be, a lot to be modest about. But, uh, da -da 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 -da. Bon. Anyway, okay, where are we going to go? Music. And, and I, used to, I used to play the piano. Did you? When I was in uh, grammar school at St. Angelo's uh, Grammar School over at Addison and Plano. I, was, uh, I played in, and I received many, many awards. And I also received a big award at uh, McCormick Place oh. when they had, a, had some kind of a doings there. That, that's back, way back in the 50s. But anyways, I, I, somewhere I have all the ribbons and, and hmm. stuff that I won when I was a, when I was play piano. Now, well, do you do it anymore? No. I never know. And then I also started to learn to play the organ, but then other things got in, got in, I got involved in, and I never followed up on the organ. My dad was quite the piano player. Oh, he used to come home from work and sit in front of him and just play for hours and hours and hours. And then um, my mother bought him an organ. He used to he used to enjoy playing playing the organ. Was he able to play without music? He yes, could just sit yes, down and play. Yes, and did you play yes. classical music or pop music? Well, it was classical. Yeah. You know. But he they, must have been very good. Yes, yes. The one song that my dad, whenever anybody talks about uh, <laughs> piano or anything, is the one we used to play. And even the neighbors would stand out in front of the house listening to it. Was uh, the Indian Love Call? <laughs> that was that. That was <laughs> really, Jeanette McDonald yeah, and Nelson yeah, yeah. Eddy, right? Yeah, because yeah, because we lived. You know, you're talking about Lane Tech High School. Uh, uh, Steve, uh, I lived at Addison and Oakley. That's where I was <laughs> born and raised. Oh. And when I looked out my bedroom window. 
facing west, I could see the Lane Tech clock tower. And in the morning, I used to hear the, the, the <coughs> chimes go off. And if I look over to the south south a little bit, I saw Riverview Park's uh, uh, parachute jump over there. The yep, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> By the well, way, the, you know, be, music, music is something that, I mean, you can do. I mean, I'm a classic example of you can do your entire life. You know, I mean, every five years or so at St. Rita for the homecoming, they have an alumni band. And uh, I'm usually one of the oldest people there. But if there's any former football players that are in the stands, after I get through playing, I say, okay, now let's see you guys go out there and play football. (laughs) (laughs) uh, My son played a uh, trumpet. And one of the fun things we did, we went to uh, Washington, D.C. and played at the Pentagon. And we were also at the National uh, Cathedral there, and they saw him put up the last gargoyle. So that was pretty interesting. It was 1989, something like that, 88, somewhere in that period of time. What is the last gargoyle? You know what this, you know, somebody looks like you and spits water out. (laughs) (laughs) I know you're right, but what am I? (laughs) Talk about a straight I mean, what is that last gargoyle, I mean? (laughs) <laughs> but yeah that was uh it takes a lot of cathedrals t- took somewhere around 100 years to build so in many cases the architect never saw its completion Some took more than and that, the other problem came in they had several architects so consequently you see the variation mm-hmm. as they <clears throat> are being built because one tower may be one design, another one may be another design, stuff like that. There's a cathedral in Spain that still is not completed. I think it's in maybe Barcelona. It's been under it's for hundreds of years, and it's still not completed. It could be. Yeah, they start out with chapels, and mo- many of the cathedrals have multiple chapels, and they they'll hold the services in the chapel, and the main uh, cathedral mm-hmm. apparently is not used until way after everybody forgot what it was for. <laughs> You know, that type of thing. Well, I, I know uh, when I was about 8 or 10 years old, I thought that The Hunchback of Notre Dame was a football movie because, you know, <laughs> back, <laughs> Notre Dame, what else would it be but Four football? Four Horsemen, The Hunchback. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is it, is, someone said it, it's not. <laughs> but anyway, we digress. We what do we start here with, uh, folk music or local, any Native American music that we uh, had in Chicago or... We we had we had Native American music on the uh, program. Remember, we had the yeah. guy from the Indian Center. Yeah. He sang. Uh, oh. He 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 brought he brought his tom tom. That's right. Uh, you remember anybody what, remember what? that? Yeah. Us? He brought yeah. what what? Yeah, he was. Uh, I think I think that's one of the more universal instruments around is the drum, whether mm-hmm. it's on a log or on a skin or whatever mm-hmm. it is. It seems to be the most universal. You know, we could talk about the evolution of music from vaudeville to the big bands and all kinds of interesting things. But what I find interesting, you know, there's a lot of music today. It doesn't have a melody. It's just a beat. And a lot of people call it noise. But you really listen to some of the hip-hop music and some of the what they call pop music, which doesn't resemble music as we know. But the drumming and everything is very similar to, like, Indian music. Yeah. If you listen, there's, there's some kind of uh, very simple, old kind of... Well, a lot. Of, I think a lot of the old, going on. a lot of the old drums sort of uh, mimic the heart. So it does exactly right. You got it yeah. exactly with the bass right. drum. Yeah, it's the heart beating. Beat, right. beat, beat of life. The beat, yeah. beat, beat of life. You gotta yeah. have heart, right? <laughs> well, well why wouldn't it melody. though? When you think about that, you know. <laughs> so, so it would be primordial, like going back to our most ancient ancestors. That sort of a, a beat you're saying, right? Yeah. Can't improve on it, can you? Okay, well, what do we have now? Uh, why don't we start with the earliest popular music we can go to around Chicago? Would be uh, it would be time for a break. That's what it would be. Now, for a brief intermission, you've been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians. <laughs> Hey friends, do you need an awning over your front, side, or rear door, or your windows? How about a canopy for your carport, 
or a patio cover over your patio so you can enjoy being outside in case of rain in the warm weather. All you have to do is call Awnings and more, and Raphael Bogus will drive over, measure up whatever you need, and go from there. You can call Awnings and more at 773 710 8403 or 847 890 1447. So if you need an awning for your windows or doors, call Raphael Bogus at Awnings and More at 773-710-8403 or 847-890-1447. Raphael also installs hand railings for your front side or back steps. You must be safe when you go up and down the steps, especially in bad weather. So for awnings or handrails, Call Raphael Bogus at 773-710-8403 or 847-890-1447. Call today for a free estimate. Now, back to our show. Jack? You do know that Shurs High School does have an organ. I do not know about that. Yeah, Ooh. it's a... It's a beautiful one. Yeah. A student taught there in 1969. Didn't know that? <coughs> it's, it's one of the only high school that I know of that has so, an organ. I forget the name of it. I should. I should know the name. But they've had a few recitals and concerts. Now, yeah. some of those... These work. These work. Some of those can be really intricate, can't they? Organs? I mean, the... Uh, Theater organs or whatever they had, those really. Oh, yeah. well, that's a good one. They have a Wrigley Field, isn't it? Theater and, uh, the that was the first old, place. The old stadium. Movie yeah. That's the first pl- uh, ballpark to have an organ. Right, Wrigley now, Field. right now, the one at, at uh, Wrigley is all electronic, but it used to, they used to have pipes. Did they? Yeah. I mean, they, they were the first park that had the, introduced yeah. the organ yeah. to the. If you really want yeah. to see an organ, you go out to San Filippo Estates, the and they have an 8,000 pipe organ there. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, right yeah. here, right here in the neighborhood, you got. Well, Gateway used to have it. They moved that out of there. Mm-hmm. They had one in uh, the Portage Theater. They took that one out now because management right changes. I patio. Thought was, yeah. I thought it was still there. You, you uh, Portage, I, I think know. Dennis took it out. How about uh, uh, um, it was there last time I looked. Was it okay? Hmm. But the patio does have one. Yes, but yeah. it's in bad shape. It needs repair work. Yeah. The Pickwick still works. Okay. Yeah, and Dennis. Uh, the music box. They have one. They right? have one, yeah. Yeah, I've yeah. been there for a while. But yeah, it's hard to find parking there. Mm. <laughs> anyway, yeah. getting back to this, be the origins of this popular music or whatever we have. In, wh- where do we start with uh, uh, Steve, Ron, Tom? Where do we start with this? Ron. Pick, pick a year. Uh, pick a year. Well, you could start. I mean, how far back you want to go? The original folk, folk music, I mean, the original immigrants that came over to this country, they brought all their their uh, unique ethnic music with them. I know country and western music now, their origin was uh, the Scotch-Irish uh, mm-hmm. folk songs, guitars, banjos. Square dance you know, is kind of like that, right? It's amazing. I mean, I, I play the guitar, not well, but you know, you know three, if you can play three cor- chords on a guitar, you can play about 75% of American and Irish folk music. <laughs> uh, it's the same with blues too. Yeah. Blues music mm-hmm. uh, is three chords. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, blues and country western is not much different. It's just the uh, hmm, the tempo that they use on it. Well, there's uh, they, they, yeah, they how, how do you safely define one one from another? Like someone will say, they this is a big hit, country western, also pop or whatever you know, rockabilly, and you have uh, all Louis, cross. Louis Armstrong always said, if you had to explain it, then you can't, don't know what it is. Or yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, Louis yeah. said there was good music and bad music right. and nothing else. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, things used to be different, just like the world. Everything was different. Now everything's kind of homogenized. Today, country sounds a lot like rock, yeah. and it's very hard right, to... Cu- uh, right, cu- right, country today. I mean, Taylor Swift, she she was made it huge in the so-called country music uh, 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 style, and now she's 
totally pass that by and you you call her rock pop uh you know, but, uh, talking about the old music, uh, I go. M my expertise only goes back to 1917, but that's the original Dixieland jazz band, and the old Dixieland music was a lot like marches. It was very similar to right. uh, two strains and a trio, the third part, and then they had a part called the dog fight, and it was all the same as that. And then Louis Armstrong came along and kind of brought blues to that kind of music in a kind of a mixture. And uh, I do some shows for seniors, and I show a lot of Louis Armstrong, and I... It's almost like if Louie wasn't there, we wouldn't have the rock and roll of today. It's just kind of the mm. basis for everything. I mean, you can... Well, rockabilly, uh, Elvis yeah. Presley made that real popular. Sure. I mean, Louie was 40 yeah. years before him. Right. Sure. Oh, of course. But, yeah, Elvis's music is kind of based on that old blues. So. Yeah, and then the other one that uh, made things a lot of popular was uh, John Philip Sousa. Yes. <laughs> he had march bands. <laughs> and he... Uh, he still strikes a, a chord in a lot of people when they they play uh, marches, and uh, you know can't can't beat them. There are probably a lot of marches that are played that people don't even know was a Sousa march. Yeah, Monty <laughs> Python, but Liberty like Bell, a, the Liberty like Bell a, march. Yeah. yeah, but like I said earlier, I mean every ethnic group. Germans had their music, Polish have their music, continue to have it. Yeah, I'm playing in a Czech band yeah, now, which is very similar yeah. to polka music, yeah, right. but uh, it all has its place. So it's nice they're keeping the old music alive. There are groups that are still and keeping it, it alive in its original form. Right. Well, we got the old uh, Germanic music, too, that from uh, primarily Bavaria and those areas, which to some degree overlaps with Czech because they're so close together. And then you got the polkas that uh, is not Polish. It's actually Czech. Contrary to a lot of people's belief, <laughs> well, for the for the Polish, their their folk music is is totally different. Yeah. Polka is actually Americanized. It right. didn't yeah, didn't originate there's, there's it originated style. here. Polka originated here for the Polish people. Tourists go to Poland and these then, days and want expect to hear polkas, and they, they, they no. and it's, it's not, not the same. It's, it's, it's not it's the out, same. It's totally obsolete. There, yeah. There's also yeah, if you go to different cities, you also have different. Uh, beat to I guess the Polish to the polkas, it's uh, the different dance and stuff like that. You you'll see how they dance is completely different. It's very you regional. Got the Chicago style polka. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very regional because if you go up to Wisconsin, you had a lot more German people. Yeah. So you had the German influence. If you went out uh, west to Iowa, uh, Nebraska, you, the, you had the, the Czech Czech, Czech yeah. influence. Well, and you got the big a, Pennsylvania polka. It's <laughs> like, <laughs> it's oh, like that, traditional. That's, that's also funny. You always. The old cliche was always the Pennsylvania Dutch, but no, they were actually Deutsch. German. The Deutsch. Yeah. Deutsch. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, in Irish music, I mean, you it, it's got it became so Americanized. All the the popular <coughs> so-called Irish songs were written by Jews in New York. Yeah, like, what know, about they, the, the uh, Unicorn? Right. The by Shel so Silverstein. That's, that's why a lot of <laughs> foreign-born Irish come to the United States, and they they listen to some Irish folk group and they play no traditional Irish music. And well, you know Irving the, Berlin who was Jewish wrote the most you know Easter Parade, oh White yeah. Christmas, God yeah. Bless America, kind of oh a little yeah. bit of everything. Oh, yeah. I George, M. Now, George M. Cohen. Just to put in a little blurb of an ad, uh, Hershey Chappelder has come back to Chicago. He's supposed to be portraying Irving Berlin which would be a great uh, show for great, people to see. Great show. But yes, er, you know it's a, it's always funny where the the Jews always seem to want to divorce themselves from the Christian religion. But some of the best singers were cantors. Oh sure, any <laughs> cantor. Uh. <laughs> 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 that wasn't what they did though. They sang. Al the, They sang yeah. in the, in the uh, synagogue. Yeah. The cantor, yeah. Well, they sang in the synagogue, but they also sang a lot of Christmas songs, too. Yeah, I know, but I'm saying they, well, the, the the jazz singer, the famous movie that had brought the, so much sound to the, not all sound, to the... It was the first, it was first the, real... The father was a rabbi, and his son, he, he was disgracing him by becoming a, a, a jazz singer instead of the cantor. Yeah, well, that well, was actually, I guess, the first talk he was uh, Al Joseph. Yeah, it's it's a sem it's, it's, it's most of it is a silent movie, but yeah. but the, but there is the singing and there is a little bit of dialogue, I think, in it. Not much. Well, but it it's funny. basically a silent movie with some talking, but it, 
You know, that made he it said the first the, the, one, the one scene that was most impressive You was ain't seen nothing he's yet. He's talking to his mother, not even singing, but talking, and that was really what, I guess, made it. But it uh, started the thing rolling. There was I, was, a I was watching uh, Channel uh, TV yesterday, uh, and they had SNA silent movie from huh. 1916 on. Wow. And I was surprised. You know, it was all piano uh, background, and... Uh, some minor sound effects, you know, like walking and stuff like that. But uh, there was, the uh, rest of it was silent, you know. Well, there had been many experiments with trying to mix sound with movies before the jazz singer, but but they they the problem was synchronizing. They couldn't yeah. get it synchronized the dialogue with the with the movements of the the lips. Okay, yeah, I I know S and A was a uh, big Chicago uh, studio, and they. They moved out west, and I found out. Everybody said it because of the weather. That was not true. Uh, you have to blame Edison for that. Edison invented the uh, movie c cameras as such, and he wanted complete control over what was being shown. And consequently, to avoid him, they moved far away from him as possible, which is California. And the weather also helped a little bit and then other things, but it was a big basic, basically it was Edison that uh, caused them to move out west. There was a big motion picture industry in New York long before Hollywood. There were a lot of films being made in and around, in New Jersey and in and around New York City before they, they made Well, the big Chicago was the Hollywood of, uh, before Hollywood, Hollywood. Hmm. And, uh, Not really. <laughs> never, no. like, never, never, never. <laughs> but SNA was a big studio, and they had yeah. uh, all our great stars. Yeah, Spore and Anderson were the two guys. SNA, and they, they talk about yeah. Charlie Chaplin. Made all, he made one movie here, his new job, and then they they went to California. They he did anyway with SNA. But we digress. Back to the music. Let's go. Where were we now? I was oh. going to make the point that one of our great cool. composers and lyricists, Cole Porter. Ah. Many of his melodies are of, of a Middle Eastern origin. Uh, there's this ver great similarity to a lot of the Cole Porter popular hits. Uh, do you find that, Steve? Or? Yes, yeah, I didn't never thought of that, but you're right. You're right. No, begin right the Begin and you know. a lot of the other stuff. Yeah, to me, the best, the, the, some, you know, I mean, there's so many great composers, but the, the big names were uh, Cole Porter, George Gershwin. Gershwin Irving Berlin and Richard Rogers. You can't get too much. And I just, they just had a show on Channel 11 about Jimmy Van Heusen. He was fantastic, too. And, uh, boy, those guys are just it was called the Great American Songbook. And uh, mm -hmm. there are people, I could tell you stories, there are people today writing music like that. They've recorded music like that. They're using some of the greatest singers, and you'll never hear about it. It's just never going to be played on the radio. It's never going to become popular around the world. But, you know, they sell things on the Internet and people get famous yeah. that way but there are still people doing it but you just don't hear about it yeah. what a shame well, well you know what yeah, when there's I, a lot of the composers study classical music so a lot of the music yeah. came from the classicals so they're originally back probably of 17th century as far as some of their ideas came from well it just comes from all over from right. all the different eras of classical music and people still study it today but uh, it's just it's a it's a different world, you know. It's a, I I shouldn't use this word. It's politically incorrect what I'm going to say. Go. But it's a dumbing down, you know. There's this dumbing down because the the old songs of the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s it told a story and it was wonderful chords and wonderful harmonies. And now the music is like one note, one chord. You don't hear a melody. It's just it, it's just it's a whole different world. Isn't um, someone once said that the the advent of sound <coughs> movies. That the uh, it kind of filled the ga the the void for composers with the uh, with the soundtrack for a movie you know like uh, people like uh, Ma Max Steiner or uh, uh, Eric Eric Wolfgang Korncold or uh, uh, Franz Waxman had all been com basically uh, I believe they're all European weren't they Yes they were Max Steiner too uh, I'm not sure about yeah, that Yeah but they yeah. but they all were doing well you listen to the all the overtures I mean the uh, uh, for Robin Hood, or for King Kong, that's or one, uh, I mean, that, that's one of the greatest scores of all time. The music in Robin Hood is just unbelievably mm -hmm. good. Yeah, you know, all those old movies. You know, we listen to them. Even TV shows, you hear backgrounds <coughs> that it, written in that style, and it gave all the arrangers and composers so much work, and all the musicians playing for it. You know, now it's all done on on synthesizer, and it's written by one person. But <laughs> those people, what a little niche that was uh, doing 
great, great you background know, music. You know, you just mentioned the synthesizer. You know, I hear a lot of old songs and old recordings, and I think to myself, that was actually played by an, by an orchestra, because now you hear... I mean, some fantastic soundtrack, and like you said, it's done by synthesizer with one guy. And what's real interesting, in they, the, the way they record now, I don't like it. They use too many microphones, and there's too much mixing. And when they record whole orchestras, now it sounds like a synthesizer. <laughs> right. And they should use the old techniques my, where it sounds real, my, not my fake. Fav my favorite recording session, or one of them, my recording session stories, Glenn Campbell, before he became <coughs> Glenn Campbell. Glenn Campbell. He was a... Uh, session musician sure. and there's so many fantastic session musicians you know that never made it big but play for big names and vice versa but anyway uh glenn campbell tells the story uh that he was in a uh he was a session musician in one of frank sinatra's recording sessions and uh he said that at the end of the session one of frank sinatra's managers uh, was talking to Frank, and he saw that Frank looked over at him and said something. So when Frank left, he walked up to the manager and said, I saw Mr. Sinatra look at me and say something. What did he say? And Frank said, uh, who's that faggot that keeps on staring at me? <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get beyond this now, I'm going to plead ignorance. And uh, Ron and uh, uh, Ron, Steve, Tom... What is a synthesizer? Can you tell? Yeah, what yeah. The, uh, Moog made it. Yeah, Moog was a big uh, name. Ron, uh, Ron, see. It's a keyboard there. that uh, plays many different electronic sounds. How's that for a description? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it imitates other. Uh, well, yeah. you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. You can do an organ that uh, could call a synthesizer because they could do a lot of music. different organs. Right, synthetic music. It's also also called a MIDI system. So no. was it? Right. It's also called a MIDI system. So the, a lot of the stuff we're hearing now on <coughs> TV, especially, probably is done that way. Or? Well, a show like NCIS, that's pretty much all synthesizer MIDI stuff. Mm. All the music that you're hearing. Yeah, they used to be uh, astronomical, uh, cost-wise, the original ones. Now you can go to. Uh, Costco and buy one that get can do almost everything the original ones did for a few hundred dollars. Yeah. I've got a hundred and twenty-five dollar keyboard, Yamaha keyboard. I bought at Kmart a long time ago, and it'll sound exactly like a cello, exactly like a violin. Vibes, yeah. bells, it's it's it makes a hundred different. I did a recording with my ten-piece ballroom band, and I added a whole violin section, plucking it and bowing it, and I added accordion, organ. Uh, vibraphone, all kinds of stuff, and people say, "How did you play all those instruments?" I said, "I did it all on his keyboard, yeah. on a synthesizer. Yeah, it was a, very simple." It's amazing. It's mm -hmm. amazing. I don't think uh, I'm gonna stop and get one on the way home. Uh, the mm -hmm. other one that I I enjoy a lot. I'm not sure how much it was synthesized, but it was the uh, theme from Star Wars. That was all real, <coughs> John. Yeah, Williams. it was. Uh, yeah, John. Uh, John Williams. John, John Williams. Williams. He was the Wagner of America. Yeah, he was. He's great. He was great. You know, he's still doing well. On that. Oh, John Williams, and who else do we have? Uh, well, uh, Leonard, Leonard Bernstein. And yeah, Bernstein. Bernard there. Herrmann was a big mm -hmm. name. In yeah, Bernard Herrmann came Herman. to uh, Hollywood with Orson Welles, I believe, from uh, oh, right. CBS, Bert right? And, and Alfred, e Alfred Newman, not Alfred. the Alfred Newman from <laughs> Mad Magazine. <laughs> yeah, Alfred, Alfred Newman, Newman Alfred. and then his relatives, Lionel Newman. They yeah. were all right. heroes of the uh, music writing A lot business. of 20th Century Fox, they were always That's over right. there, among other yeah, places, yeah. but they were mostly there. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of, what's his name, um, Jerry Goldsmith. Jerry Goldsmith did Patton, score, by the way, he did uh, for um, Rudy, and others. There are others, too, but I mean, they... Well, you know, synthesized Aaron music, Copeland. one of the first big fights uh, yeah. with the Spring. Musicians Union uh, out in Las Vegas was, you know, they, they were very strong at the time. Now unions have basically non-existent, but at the time... Th uh, the, especially the big hotels, you had to have live music. Yeah. You know, you're not going to bring any recorded music in here. <laughs> you know, in the old days, the Petrillo Bandshell was named after Petrillo, who was the head of the uh, a musicians. Look, I remember when, when I first start playing in some side jobs and we get gigs in, like, down, 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 downtown hotels or big banquet venues, the Musicians Union, they card you. So we, I joined. I mean, you had to join. Because in those days, if you didn't, 
they come up and say, let's see your cards, and then you take a break, and you come back, and your trumpet is bent in half yeah. or whatever. <laughs> I mean, that that was Petrillo. Yeah, that was his well, There's a lot of jokes style. made. Bob Pope uh, made remarks yeah, about yeah, Petrillo, yeah, too. Yeah, right? You yeah. remember yeah. the good old days of the uh, Chicago Theater. <laughs> used to have a band in there all the time, in the, along with the movie. So mm-hmm. you had... Uh, you know, Dean Martin, uh, all those people were in there at one time, and I think part of the problem was that demands of the union were such that it just killed the whole session. I'm not sure about well, that. Well, I shouldn't say this, but Petrillo really did, when you look at a history of it, killed the big bands because they went on strike, and all of a sudden people like Perry Como and the singers started coming in, and then it became all the singers, and that was the real end of the... There were still big bands playing a lot, but it wasn't the same, and that's that's what did it. Well, part of the problem with big bands, too, was the fact that they undercut each other along with it. They, that's what I, understanding I had. Not so much. No, they had a charge union scale, which was pretty good. So okay. the, the famous big bands always got good pay. But, but uh, uh, now they're, everybody's undercutting everybody because nobody wants to pay money you know, for live music. <laughs> That's another right. story. One, one thing that I came across is that most people today, and probably going back to the 50s, they associate silent movies with the background of a tinny piano because right. that's how it's usually portrayed mm-hmm. in talking pictures when they wanted to portray silent movies there'd be a guy playing a tinny piano but in in reality the big theaters downtown or in new york or in the big cities would have orchestras so you would when you went to see a a, a top flight silent movie you weren't listening to this guy with a with a bow tie and and, and arm arm garters, you know, playing a tinny piano. There was actually an orchestra there. Well, a big feature playing, playing real a, music. A big feature would have a, sc- a score written for it. Sure. Original. Sure. Oh, uh, well, the other one was the fact that you also had the organs playing, not the, only the piano, but a lot of yeah, them. Chicago when they, Yeah, when they first started out, though, a lot of them used to s- sit there and watch the movie and actually synchronized themselves with playing the movie they didn't have a score yeah now the chicago symphony's playing concerts where they'll project the movie on a screen and the symphony's playing the score yeah. so uh my wife who is ken little's daughter is yeah. uh going to be going in a couple weeks to one of those and they're, they're fantastic no, that's silent silent. They're, they're not a silent movie though so some are talking they, some are, some yeah. are, they did metropolis that's silent they yeah. recently yeah. did metropolis, metropolis yeah. Yeah. and you hear the chicago symphony play the score it's unbelievable i, I went to see metropolis and i walked out i didn't clark kent wasn't in it and lois <laughs> lane and I, so I got bored and i left no uh, daily planet no there's no daily that planet was, that in it. was a that was an early movie and uh, most of it a lot of it was missing and that's where the part of the problem came in with metropolis because that was what the hell was that, about 100 years ago or something like no, that? No, it's not that old. Late 20s, middle 20s. 20s yeah. yeah, uh, German, Fritz yeah. Lang. Yeah. I, have to give a, I have to give a plug to my friend Jay Warren, who runs the Silent, Mu- Mu- Silent Movie Society of Chicago. And they still do show silent movies throughout the Northwest Side, Pickwick Theater, some of the other theaters. And they are accompanied either by the pipe organ and occasionally with an orchestra. <laughs> They've had the the movie shown. Well, they had a problem because they used to be based over at the uh, at the gateway. Well, well, there was also one over at the uh, uh, the bank over on Irving Park. Northwest Federal Savings. It yeah, was yeah. North, Northwest Federal Savings. Well, they yeah. never they never had uh, any. That was Chuck, uh, in Chuck Shaden's oh. start with their program. Though. Yeah, that was oh. Chuck Shaden's baby there. Okay, they're Chuck, still there, Chuck aren't they? Chuck Chayton had a, a store across on Irving Park, and then he moved over on uh, Addison. Addison. Addison, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Metro oh, Golden no. Memories it was. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's still, Chuck is still around. He yeah, he's down in Florida. He uh, now. Uh, <laughs> Arizona, I think it is. Yeah, but his, and his old show is still on uh, the public Steve radio Darnell. station. Darnell yeah, I, I, I listen to it when I can, because it's... They're, t- they're coming out of the college to page, and they can't always get good reception. Yeah. That's where the problem comes in in that. Yeah. But uh, Dennis still goes to different movie theaters, like the Pickwick. Uh, I know he did a thing down at the St. John Cantius Parish over by oh. Chicago and Ogden. And they show the, the silent movies, and it's accompanied by the organ. Oh, they had they had a problem, like I said, with uh, movie houses closing all the time. So they oh, yeah, had, yeah. They had to rotate around. They were out the Splains, too, at once. The Displains yeah. Theater. That's sitting again. You know, we yeah. were doing nothing. We were talking earlier, Jack was talking about the jazz singer, the first talking film. And what's not commonly known is that that was part of Hollywood's response to radio. Radio in the 1920s had as much of an effect on the box office as television did in the 50s. 
receipts were going down, and they they had to they were experimenting with all sorts of things to deal with the rise of radio. They experimented with wide screens, they experimented with color, and sound was the other thing mm -hmm. that they thought they could use because they were they were radio was so big in the twenties when it when it really came in, particularly in the mid twenties, <coughs> that that they had to react to it in the same way that in the nineteen fifties television had the effect. Uh, the understanding color. I had that uh, FM was first. Before AM came in the play, maybe technologically, mm -hmm. but I mean it wasn't it wasn't commonly used. It wasn't brought. Maybe maybe technically they developed a FN, but AM was was what. Oh, was the other thing was a lot of people don't know were probably radios. about the late thirties when TV first started up too. But they had before no, that nothing much was going on. Yeah, there was nothing before. going on with it. Nineteen thirty nine was the first. I believe so. Yeah, the first commercial stations were actually licensed here in nineteen forty. I think three or four radio stations had them. Of course, no one had any money to buy a television until the Great World War II was over, and well, after that, that, that was... That killed it right there for right. a few years, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the radio, radio started up a lot, a lot before that, broadcasting all the big bands, too. That's right. Because that's, that's Lombardo the, got his start right here on, on Cottage Grove. Yeah. Now, we're, we're all should be old enough. Everybody remember silent television before we had sound and television? Mm. Oh. No, oh. Watching television? test patterns was big. I remember <laughs> watching <laughs> test patterns. I remember yeah, as a kid getting up and watching <laughs> test patterns. That, oh, excuse me, that Native American on the test pattern? Oh, jeez. My, 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 my mom, I remember my mom and dad telling people that I would get up at 5 or 5.30 and turn on the TV and sit there and watch the test patterns. <laughs> you know, when, I was, when, I was, when I was five years patterns. old, we had the first television on the block. We lived on... Uh, Western and Foster, right there on Berwyn, and uh, kids, people would come over to watch the test oh, patterns. Yeah. I mean, that's, they make jokes on Happy Days yeah. about that, but it's really true. You had the Indian head on there, and yeah. you had well, all the, the the geometric designs. And yeah, I the remember a neighbor of mine. I think it was 1947. He had the first TV, and we used to go over his house. My dad bought ours. Uh, I think 49 at Admiral. Uh, Is that the round screen? No, I actually screen. had the, you know, it was pretty, it was about uh, probably 12 inch or something like that. And, uh, the choice was 12 or 16 inches, I yeah. remember. Yeah. And uh, then you used to have the uh, magnifying glass in front of the round oh, screen. Sure. Mm -hmm. You remember that one? Well, yeah. who remembers Madman Months? Oh, yeah. <laughs> when Months TV. Pay, pay yeah. for, dollar uh, pay, was that the yeah, dollar meter plan? Yeah, the meter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. CET. You you put a quarter in there. nickel meter the, plan. Yeah. Quarter. Yeah. Mohawk quarter. Yeah, you put the, CET the, for television. Yeah. Mohawk. Yeah, he also and the, and then when you had enough money deposited in the meter, then you could buy the, the television set. Yeah. By which oh point God. it was obsolete already. Yeah, right. <laughs> but Muntz, Muntz built his own TVs, too. You know, it wasn't only that he he didn't uh, go out and... I don't know who, who built them for him, but he, he uh, built TVs for you know, his Muntz TV out there. So. Well, we had a Dumont we got in 1950. Oh, yeah. Dumont. Yeah. The the Bruce Dumont's father was the yeah, inventor. Yeah. I was wondering if they're related, and I saw a picture of his father. I said, yeah, they're related. No yeah. doubt about it. But well, there was, there, there was uh, Muntz, there was Admiral, there was Zenith. Admiral and Zenith are gone. And Ray is gone. Sears was silver tone. Philco. Philco. And silver tone. Oh, silver tone. Sears. Raytheon. John, you got something to say? Raytheon, yes, that, yeah. uh, in 1948, my dad bought uh, the f our first TV. Was a it was a TV set that was on on a stand. He bought it from Becker's Radio and Television up in Evanston, Illinois. And my dad and Johnny Altmaier and myself, we put up the antenna uh, up on the roof. And after we were all done, we sat down and watched the first World Series uh, baseball game wow. on television back in know. 1948. Wow. And we had a Philco. That was we, uh, we Cleveland and uh, Cleveland and. We trains? got we got our we got our first television in 1956, and then we got electricity in 1958. <laughs> <laughs> now, somebody mentioned years. something the other day that brought back a lot of memories. Something we all did, and I completely forgot about it. Remember at the drugstores, they'd have the tube testers. Oh, yeah. So oh, when a yes. tube would go bad, you'd take yeah. it out of the oh, set. Yeah. You'd go to the drugstore, yeah. test the tube, yeah. come back, replace yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. dad had his own tube. My dad, I've, I've still got it. He's That's got a very little, impressive. He his little yeah. portable oh, my God. tube tester. I, I, still I have remember <laughs> helping him test the tubes. I thought that was fascinating, watching all these dials and, 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 and the needles yeah. going yeah. back and That's forth. That's right. I forgot about And most of us would have to see a TV repairman It was like watching Captain Video. It was also Radio Shack was a big thing on that, too, or what to call Radio it wasn't Radio Shack at the time, what was it? Ad uh, Admiral was on the b big uh, electronics. Allied. It was Allied Radio. Oh, Allied. 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 Yeah. 100 yeah. Northwestern there, Avenue. There you go. Yeah. 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 Across at the home. street was Olsen Electronics with right. the cheap right. stuff. Yep. Yeah. 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 And I used to I used to repair TV sets, too. In fact, in my garage out there, I still have my tube tester yet. Yeah. Wow. And one time I was I was testing the tubes, and I wasn't touched the, touch the high voltage 
wire that went to the picture tube, Oops. and I still have marks on my elbow Ooh. just the way I went went back like that. I have on my desk. I've got my dad's plastic screwdriver. There's uh -huh. this little yep. tiny plastic yep. screwdriver that's, that's right. that you had to use yep. when you would deal with the Ex television. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Little. It's, it's. It doesn't look like it's called a screwdriver, though. It doesn't really look like it because it's, it's very thin. No. But it's made out of plastic, yeah. and then, and yeah. I remember my dad explained to me that you can't use a real screwdriver because of the electricity, the charge, yeah. and because you you have too many screwdrivers, you won't know what you're doing. Yeah, you repairing. No. We've we've still got at home. We've got this beautiful mahogany cabinet that would that housed our first television. Oh, pardon my, TV. pardon me, John. I must interrupt sure. you. You're listening to Meet the Chicago Historians, and we thank you for it. We'll be right back. Friends, are you looking for a place to have some printing done? Well, I have the right place for you to go, and that is the printing store in Oak Park, Illinois. Call or see Phil Berry at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois, or call 708-383-3638. Phil will sit down with you and help you plan whatever you need printed. Now his products are brochures, booklets, business cards, catalogs, envelopes, letterheads, flyers, invitations, newsletters, notepads, menus, mailers, manuals, labels, posters, postcards, price lists, NCR forms, cell sheets, table tents, pocket folders, and presentation forms. And his services include one to four color offset printing, digital copying, high speed copying, graphic designs, typesetting, laminating, foil stamping, die cutting, and imprinting. And he also has a complete binary service which includes booklets, cutting, scoring, folding, numbering, padding, and drilling. So once again, for all your printing needs, See or call Phil Berry at the printing store at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois, or call 708-383-3638. And once again, they are located at Madison Street and Clarence Avenue, just east of Oak Park Avenue. And it's at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, or call 708-383-3638. And ask to speak to. Now back to our special music edition of Meet the Chicago Historians. Jack? Yeah, someone's wondering why you were in. I was asking why we're not singing the whole show. Chicago. Should we try that from here on? Chicago. No, let's not. Yeah. How about some of the how about some of the famous uh, or you know well known popular uh, composers like I know um, I know George Gershwin got to be pretty serious, but he started out doing ripples and uh, rags early on. Uh, George and Ira, yeah. You know that. But anyone remember the Ernie, Ernie, old Ernie Kovacs show? Oh yeah, oh, vaguely. His the theme turned, trio. His, the this theme turns out was a George Gershwin. Ripple, ripple, rag, ripple, r Rialto rag, ripple. Oh. Da, 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 um, uh. Very fast. Anyway, I'm not going to try and do it now, but that was turned out to be one of his, like from 1917. How about um, Scott Joplin? He got to be well known, of course, with the Sting when that came out in '73. But yeah, he, he, he predates that quite a bit, doesn't he, Steve? Yeah, he was a uh, house, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Was he? When, when and is Irving he Berlin's first song, big song, was Alexander's Alexander's Ragtime Band, Ragtime. which is not a ragtime song, but yeah. it's just in the title. But it's still an old type sounding song. So all those composers started out with that kind of music, and then they all evolved 
and became a little more uh, modern. Some even evolved towards classical music. Is there an yeah. easy way to define ragtime? Do you think? Uh, yeah, I I yeah, I could. But it's it's hard to describe. No, no. But if I had my trumpet or a piano, I could play a little things. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of like, it doesn't swing like jazz. It's kind of an even sound, and. Uh, it's like 2-4 as opposed to 4-4, four, four, which doesn't mean much to a lot of people. And uh, I don't know. I don't know how to describe does it. Does it sound like a piano roll, kind of? It does, yes. Even if it's not. Yeah. And there's a certain not. left-hand pattern. I could show you. Ron could show you on the piano in a couple seconds, and you could say, oh, yeah, I understand that. Sure. John, why don't you have a piano down here today? <laughs> he plays it, and you can, what, what, I'm telling you. One of these... Can't get good help anymore. <laughs> if we're lucky, the ice cream guy will come past down Ottawa here, and we'll hear the yeah. the song yeah. play. I can play Scott, Heart and Soul. Dun, Scott, da, da, dun, da, da. Can you Scott play Joplin far, far went away? to a, a four end there. He was, uh, he grew up in the better word for whorehouses, and uh, they told him to stay away from the girls, and he didn't. And he died of uh, syphilis or gonorrhea, one or wow. the other. Okay. There was all kinds of Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. A lot of ragtime composers in the yeah. old days. People you've never heard of have wrote some of the best best old rags. And I play in some concert bands today, and we play a lot of the ragtime songs with concert bands. There were a lot of ones where they use the trombone section, trombone slide, trombone slide, and the slides are going up with, wah, you know. Was ragtime yeah. the first major breakaway from traditional music? They were playing it on the Titanic in 1912, that sort of thing. Is, is it a real departure from... Ron? Uh, Oh, right. It's a classical, but uh, it's it's a departure from it, but it's uh, just it, it's still it's got its own identity. Sure, yeah. sure. Well, one of the, one of the uh, one that had his own identity was Spike Jones in this band. <laughs> That's a whole <laughs> other story. Big, <laughs> yeah. big story, right there. in Der Fuhrer's face. We're getting ahead of ourselves. He, he was he was a great uh, he was a great uh, <laughs> leader, except that he started his own genre, and uh, consequently he got to you know what the. Uh, Strange music, I guess the way of putting it, but if you listen to it, it actually followed the song as it was, and they just put in a lot of impromptu type of stuff. Like well, it, it would seem like you'd have to be a good musician to be able to do that. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. you had to be. Right? I have you a bass be. player friend who I won't mention. He's one of the best jazz bass players in Chicago. He's very tall, and he plays everything just fantastic. And he told me once he played with Spike Jones for two weeks. <laughs> And it was the hardest thing he ever did. He said, I never want to do that. I said, what do you mean? You're the best player I've ever worked with. He said, everything had to be timed to the split second. And it was so difficult. He said, I just don't want to ever go through that again. I was very shocked <laughs> well, by hearing you know, that. George, if whoever remembers George Plimpton, he, oh, he sure. did mm -hmm. all those... Uh, like he played quarterback for, I think it was the Detroit Lions. And he did all kinds of... Paper Lion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they asked him once, they said, what of all these different things that you've done... What was the most difficult? And he said, the most difficult thing that I did was playing cymbals with the New York Philharmonic. He said that was the, <laughs> that was the hardest thing. He says that because, I mean, being a, a, a drummer and percussionist, you know, and uh, the cymbal crashes, you, you, either, you either nail them or you don't nail them. And he said there was some whatever song they were playing, and a major part of it was this cymbal crash right at the end. He said wow. that was the biggest stress <laughs> that he had playing the cymbals in the New York Philharmonic. Well, that's the, true. The other yeah. one that, that, yeah. that's always interesting is the 1812 Overture, which had nothing to do with the United States, but they always play it at the 4th of July. And, uh, that's a pet peeve of mine. I, I, I can't understand why the, why the 1812 Overture has become the theme song for the 4th of July. Well, well it was a war in uh, Russia at it's, the time. I know, but it's because we of, were because allied of the cannons. It's because of all the noise. The right. cannons it's it's kind of overlooked. We, we were Napoleon's ally at the time. <laughs> well, that's stretching it. We weren't allied with Napoleon. We were? We, we, no. No. We, we, enemy, we, we, we wound up fighting the British simultaneously, but we weren't in any way really allied with Napoleon. After the war was over. After the war was over? Battle of New Orleans. Was already, the Priest Treaty was already signed. But, but still, we, we, what I'm saying is we, weren't, we, we were never allied with well, Napoleon. Well, we were. We were fighting the same side. But, John, it's like you said, they've played it so many times because of the cannons and everything yeah, it's else. because of the noise. It's yeah, easy it to synchronize the fire, fire attack. I, 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 I played with... The problem there is the, Arthur the cannons. Uh, you have to blame look, Arthur Fiedler for that. I think yeah. Arthur Fiedler was the one who began with the Boston Pops playing the 1812 Overture 
on the 4th of July, and he did it because of the cannons and the sound effects and yeah, all the, the noise. The, you, the very few of them really shoot the cannons. You go out to uh, Ravinia, and they have uh, mortars they use yeah. over there, and they blow them off. I, I played, a lot of them just use a bass drum. I played with an American Legion uh, post uh, concert band. They have uh, American Legion as a national competition. I don't know if they still have it anymore, but uh, South Shore uh, post. At the state competition, the three like, top bands in the United States, uh, American Legion bands, were from Joliet, Aurora, and the South Shore. Mm-hmm. And it was a, they were like one, two, three finish in the state, and then one, two, three finish in the nationals. But anyway, to get to the point, I think it was Joliet, excuse me, Joliet. Well, there was nothing jolly about Joliet. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, their, their band, their, uh, that was their finale competition song, the 1812 Overture. And when they played it at the end, the canon part, you had to see this, but it was really, it was a great show, in other words. When it comes to the part with the cannons, some guys from the percussion section, they had two 55-gallon drums. You know, if you've ever seen, uh, like outside the police station, you'll clear your weapon here. Well, they had those type. We could clear a weapon. They had two 55-gallon drums. And when it got to the uh, uh, cannon uh, section, these guys would lay whatever their mallets down, whatever. They take headphones, they put <laughs> them on, they both pick up shotguns, and like simultaneous, they had done this a lot. Crack the gen when they dun da 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 da, da boom. Then they shoot the the shotguns into these 55 drums. gallon drums oh, to recreate. I tell you, you talk about a great presentation. That oh was. My God. Uh, I played the last two July 4ths on trumpet with the uh, Buffalo Grove Symphonic Band. We played outdoors, and they played 1812. And we were talking about synthesizers earlier, and they had a guy playing synthesizer with a very loud amplifier. And he was doing these church bell sounds. I thought I was going to die. It was so loud. And then he imitated a cannon, and nobody could believe it, but he got some kind of cannon sound out of that synthesizer. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it was get... incredible. I had earplugs, and it didn't even help. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So uh, it's very interesting. So it's uh, another part of the music business we're but, talking about here. But in, in defense of the Boston Pop, they play the 1812 Overture, but then they follow it with a much longer medley of John Philip Sousa. So I think, um, so the, the American music is rep- but I But I share your thought. I, I could never understand that people don't see the, 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 how, how you know, strange it is to be playing Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture on, on, on our 4th of July when it has nothing to do whatever well, with American you gotta history. you've got to remember a lot of people don't know history. No, that's true. That's you true. Know, so to them it's just music. It's a bunch of notes music. on music paper, and yeah, it sounds good, and it's good oh, fireworks good. music. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's, Dave, when, when I first started playing, I forget one of my music teachers, I mean, he's not the first one or last one that said it, but... When guys were looking at a score or a sheet, they'd pass out, and he says, hey, remember, there's only eight notes. Every song ever written or recorded is just a rearrangement of those same eight notes. Well, you, you take a look now, well, though, at the music scores that they play at the concerts. A lot of them, you know, have I, no idea what the hell is supposed to be for. The same thing with the, uh, New Year's Eve. You sit out there and you say, what the hell is that? You know, there's... There's a lot of racket, and then all of a sudden it's uh, midnight. You yeah. know. Ron, what were you going to say? Today, some 60, 70 years after it first was broadcast, people still say, oh, that's the Lone Ranger theme. Oh, right. And they don't know what it really is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the same. How do, you, how do you know an intellectual is someone who can listen to the William Teller Overture show without thinking the Lone Ranger? Yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah, I, never heard the, I heard the. I always I heard the uh, overture to the, uh, and I never heard the rest of. It. <laughs> well, they use the other part like that, for like the sp- sun sunrise or springtime. Da 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 da. It's actually uh, supposed to be after a storm up in the Alps, isn't it, William Tell? You know, the, and that and that da da da. That comes from. Well, I think that's from a folk anyway, theme. Yeah. Da 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 da. Da, 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 da. Right? Did I do that right? Okay, guys. Perfect. Well, thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, the first eight notes were good. Yeah. <laughs> and it went higher, but we can't sing that. Huh? Oh, I remember a lot of stuff uh, came out from the yodeling. And the yodeling, strange as it sounds, uh, yeah. has no echo. 
And consequently, they also have the chants right. in the big cathedrals because of the same reason. The up and down movement, there was no echo, so people could hear the, the uh, priest do a sermon. And he used to do the up and down stuff so that, that the uh, echo wasn't there. I think oh. the purpose of yodeling is to take advantage of the echoes so you can be heard from one mountain peak to another. Maybe I'm missing something. No, they, they told me the opposite. It was also to sell the oval team. It was, it was, a, sa it was, it was a sales pitch to, for the oval team. Well, one thing with our musical experts here today, one, so I do at my age a lot of programs on reminiscing at Mathers, and there was one brief period in our musical history, the period of the nonsense song. World War II, mm -hmm. Mersey Dotes and Dozy Dotes, Flatfoot Fluji with the Floy Floy, <laughs> Hut Sut Ralston on the Rilla Rod. Any uh, account to put those in historical perspective? They came and faded pretty fast. Yeah. I just read a book. There's a new book called The B-Side about recording, and it tells about the decline of those great American songs and how these uh, silly songs came to be. Silly songs. Novelty songs, too. Mm -hmm. So in the 50s, the novelty songs were real big. What you're talking about is the 40s. That's when it started. And they're silly songs, but it's funny. I'll play them for the seniors when I do it at Mather or wherever on my trumpet. And everybody knows those songs. Mm -hmm. It's no. just, it, boy, you talk, and I'll show a, a, a clip of Freddie Martin's band playing Hudson Rawson. Freddie and Martin played that? Yeah, the, he had the hit record. And they sing about two seconds of it, and the, everybody in the audience just smiles. But I found a video short. You know, MTV had these rock and roll shorts, which were crazy. They were absolutely crazy. But in the 40s, they had the same thing. So there's a short on Hudson Rawson, and the people are singing it, and they can't stop. It just uh, nonstop. And the, the guys with the white coats come and take them away to a padded room, and they're in a padded room hitting their head against the wall singing that song. Once you start, you can't stop. Yeah. So those are very interesting songs, and we just call them novelty Steve. songs. I right. oh, oh, just was listening, <laughs> just listening last night. Uh, Phil Harris, the thing. Right. The one oh, I'm talking yeah. about. The, that is, it's in one movie too. It's just great. <laughs> Perfect. Well, he does right. it just so well. There's always your favorite. You can't get rid of that. No matter what I do, you know, it goes right, all the way through right, like right, that. Right, right. Well, and it all started. Mitch Miller started producing things. I don't even know if he produced that one, but those were the era where oh. they were looking for new sounds, like that tapping. Mm -hmm. They're just looking for new ways and getting away from the old romantic songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow people remember that more than some people of the like others. Yeah. up and laugh and well, enjoy themselves. There's now. always your old favorite there, Purple People Eater. Oh, my favorite. <laughs> that's a little newer. Yeah, right. That's, that's the one I had one hard flying Purple People Eater. Yeah, there was there was a there's a That's car amazing. at the Harlem Murray Plaza that shows up once in a while. It's purple and the sign and his license plate says Purple People Eater. Mm -hmm. I think that purple was at Martin the same Matt. time as that song Teeny Weeny Yellow Polka Dot Bikini. Yeah, they were all the same, you know. Well what's his name? Yeah. Did the the witch doctor was uh um, Oh sure. Ooh. Oh yeah, that you know, was um, Alvin the Chipmunks, uh Stephen. David Seville, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, Ross yeah, yeah. yeah. That was his also before the chipmunks. Yeah. How about the little car that went beep beep? Remember yeah. that one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. was, that was for a Volkswagen, wasn't it? It was a Volkswagen trying to catch up to a Cadillac. Yeah. <laughs> How do you get this out of second gear? It was the whole yeah. punchline of it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, but right. that one that really struck me. It's funny, I listened to that last night on YouTube, by the way, is a great place oh, to yeah. find all this stuff. I say that YouTube is the greatest gift mm. from God to mankind. Mm -hmm. I mean, every single, a billion videos, everything you can ever think What's of. What's not on there? Yeah, there's old shows from the 50s, jazz shows, uh, things I never thought I would ever see in my mm -hmm. lifetime, and there they are, the whole show yeah. with good sound and everything. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not to get off the subject, does everyone everyone remember the silent service that about the uh, submarines, submarines, World mm -hmm. War II, when we were kids? They're all on YouTube, yeah. there's all the silent wow. service shows. Yeah. Oh my Ooh. gosh, yeah. so much there. Well, the wow. other one that I enjoyed was uh, a the railroad song, there was this... Uh, <laughs> What the heck was the name of that? Uh, Casey Jones. Well, oh, Casey Jones was a, another one. And then uh, Steam, Cinders, and Smoke. John Henry? John Henry. That was 16 tons. Oh, yeah. That was coal, Tennessee coal mining. Yeah, I just heard that last night. Ford, yeah. I just heard that last Ford, night, yeah. too. I was wondering what a, what a, what a, what a, what a, a company stole was. What's a stole? I owe my soul. To the company stole. <laughs> the store. S-T-O-R-E. The store. Yeah. The store. Yeah, supposed to be soul, that was number think, yeah. one on the really? hit parade for, company store. for decades. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It okay. went on and yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John brings up your hit parade, which your was radio parade. and television. Oh, 
Everybody remember yeah. the television version, right? John I just did Scott a my Trump. video show called Early Pop Singers, and I do a whole segment on the hit parade, and I have rare video. And it starts with the Lucky Strike cigarettes dancing. And mm -hmm. I tell them in the old days, everybody smoked. And now when you show it, every single person in the audience starts laughing yeah. when they see yeah. these dancing cigarettes. And there's Dorothy Collins yeah. saying, yeah. nine out of ten doctors prefer this. Prefer, yeah. Right? They want you to smoke. Okay, it was, uh, when I was watching, it was Dorothy Collins, Snooki Lanson. Giselle McKenzie. Giselle McKenzie and Russell, and Russell Arms, Arms. Yeah. yeah, those four. And the music of John Scott Trotter. That's right, yeah. Was well, the, other, the other one was yeah. Arthur Godfrey. No, John Scott Trotter John was, Scott uh, Trotter. no, no, he was Bing Crosby. It was uh, Dorothy Collins' husband, Raymond Scott. Ooh. Raymond Scott? Yeah. Raymond Scott yeah. Yeah. was the well, they would, leader. Um, on your hit parade, they also had uh, extras, like your hit parade, you know, little extras, all the flashback to an old song, and then produce all this. It was an hour, hour long. Hit parade Saturday. extra. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, Dave, the bell of the Davy Crockett was on top for how many weeks? Though, remember? Yeah. I thought Tennessee Waltz yeah. set the record for the numbers. Mm -hmm. number of was weeks that Patty was Page? Yeah. Yeah. The Singing Rage. Yeah. Dorothy Patty Page. Yeah. Patty. 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 And it's Patty interesting, Page. you know, the hit parade went off the air because in '57 rock and roll songs came in and they really couldn't sing those properly. You had to have the yeah. person who made them famous. <laughs> so the the show they've got on YouTube some of the 1958 and '59 hit parades. They tried to make it come back. Yeah. And it to me it was great, but they said it just didn't work. Yeah, Snooky Lance's "Hanging Hound Dog" didn't work out too well, did it? Uh, no, you got <laughs> it. That's exactly it. Just. Uh, <laughs> Something's missing. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it was really, I, I thought it was a great show. I was a young kid, of course, at the time. Uh, Poor were. People of Paris, I remember that instrumental on there. Uh, Les Baxter, sure. Well, wasn't there? I understand Sinatra was on the radio version originally. The yes, they was. had to come oh. up with a different way of singing the tune every week, with like 16 mm -hmm. times. A sketch out of it. They always had to, there was a little story. They would do it, they would, mm. and they had to, they were running out of ways to showcase the song when they had to do the same song over when I When I did my video show the other week, uh, the three days ago for the seniors, uh, one of the songs is I Need You Now, which is a big Eddie Fisher hit of mm -hmm. the 50s. So it was the 13th week it was on the hit parade service they called it so it was the 13th time they had to have a whole different storyline so yeah. russell arms was a guy in jail and his girlfriend comes with a little bag with a uh, <laughs> loaf of bread and he's singing to her i need you now and she gives him the loaf of bread and he goes like what is this and he's singing i need well he needs her now because the loaf of bread had a file in it <laughs> so as soon as the 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 uh, police left he started filing trying to break out of jail yeah he had a little funny. story to go with it you know on the week before they were on an airplane and the guy had his headphones and he was a pilot and they just have different See, scenarios you've been so watching, creative you've been, you've been seeing these on youtube recently yeah so they, creative. they haven't been shown on any of the television no. stations mm. that show old Not never no never. you might find it on pbs a little bit of that maybe oh, they got right. another one now now uh, channel two has a substation that uh, shows a lot of stuff oh they've that's interesting show, they've yeah. been showing playhouse not playhouse uh, studio one studio they've one been showing it's all been these old good. dramas yeah. studio one and yeah, they were yeah. live yeah okay can anyone remember the the announcer from your hit parade Ooh. I do, yes, sure. Andre uh, Baruch. Baruch. Andre Baruch. Baruch, Baruch. Yeah. Very distinctive voice. Who was married to B. Wayne, who was a big band Very, singer. Uh, really? he, um, he, I saw him on an um, interview with Tom Snyder when he had that show at late night. He said in World War II time, the Germans had propaganda on the radio like you know, Tokyo Rose was in the East. But he was, he was saying like, uh, oh, are you, uh, yeah, someone like Axis that. But they, well, they, they're all different ones, too. And one would say, Lord Haw -Haw, you're, 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 oh, you're, yeah. mile, you're miles from home. And it's too bad. We're sorry to see you so sad. He'd break in and say, yeah, I'm a married man, too, or something like that. He would <laughs> put a line in behind everyone to make a joke out of it. But the Germans couldn't hear it, but they could hear oh. it there, see? So that was his job. In well, I used to listen to uh, Moscow Molly when I was Moscow overseas. Molly. <laughs> Are you making this one up I thought, now? I thought, you, I thought you dated her. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny. We were in the Azores, and I, we strung a wire across the top of the roof. So that you could hear and Moscow Molly. I got a nasty shock when I hooked it up to my radio because that thing picked up power from someplace or other. And we used to listen to race, uh, Moscow Molly all the time from no. uh, Russia with her propaganda. Wow. <laughs> Be before you go any further now, uh, Al, for all of you young kids out there, the Azores, those are islands, belong to Portugal out in the Atlantic. Am I right? Right. Portugal has them. Right. Portuguese yeah, out, island. out yeah. never, never land. Now, way out there. Unlike the Canaries that belong to Spain. It's kind of like <laughs> Portugal's version of Hawaii. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, that? it wasn't a bad island. It never got Without below Don 40 Hull. or never got above 80. So, uh, other than a few, uh, once in a blue moon, you got a hurricane that came through there. It uh, was quite nice, you know. It was, uh, 
Wintertime, it got a little chilly. You had to How cold did it get? How cold? Oh, oh, well, it was... 40 degrees, you know. <laughs> oh, gee. <laughs> That's something. Not freezing. No. Another big oh, topic that? maybe we can tackle, going back to music. Yeah, there you go. The rise of the vocalist in the early big band era. I mean, okay. Maybe the single name stands, Rudy Valley, big in the early 30s. Oh. Mm -hmm. Then you started to get the male and female vocalists in the big bands, I think. A lot of, a lot of, and Sinatra's rise to fame. Sinatra, a lot of and, uh, actors. He's going to be celebrating his 100th birthday. Who's this that? December. Is he still around? Frank Sinatra. But he's not. He's not he still around. around? No, he's not quite. He's kind of in seclusion these days. Right. He doesn't. People that uh, knew him are celebrating. <laughs> yeah, Nancy was his favorite name for some reason or other. He had uh, songs with Nancy and. That was his. So wife. That name his first wife. Right. Yeah. His wife and his daughter. His wife yeah. and his daughter. Yeah. 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 I just saw his, these boots are made for walking on video last night too. Well, the uh -oh. other one that <laughs> did it sound better or worse than you remembered it? About the same. Oh, oh okay. That's the, interesting. But the other one that was sort of interesting was Arthur Godfrey. He was playing a ukulele all the time, and he <laughs> all the he Godfrey's. made Hawaii a little bit famous because he always talked about Hawaii. He used to play. Don Ho started his. Family. Yeah. And, yeah, Don Ho. Just filled cigarettes until he decided he was going to die well, of cigarette smoke, and then he decided that. It was the worst thing he ever did was start Arthur smoking. Godfrey, buy him by the carton. Yeah. It was, uh, he, um, uh, I'm sorry, Steve, did you say something? No, go ahead. Uh, Arthur Godfrey, I think, used to do a show, or he had a, a Hawaiian singer, Holly Loki was her name. Yeah. And he also had that one, um, who was a great okay. swimmer, Olympic swimmer from Hawaii many, many, many years ago. Oh. Oh. Julius <laughs> No, yeah, well, yeah, Julius wasn't from there. Now, what do you want to say, Steve? Well, we were talking about the vocalists, and you mentioned Rudy Valley, and a lot of the vocalists, early vocalists, some of them didn't have a lot of musical talent, but they had a lot of personality. So a lot of times it was more personality than their voice or whatever, and people really liked that. You know, you hear great instru instrumentalists with instrument uh, instrumental music, and people don't identify, but they sure like the personalities. So sometimes that was bigger. Like Ted Lewis didn't play clarinet. He played one note on his clarinet, but there was something about the way he sang or whatever. Was it a visual and, thing, uh, Maybe yeah. a visual thing, also yeah. sure. Yeah, so it's a, very interesting. We talked forever about the vocalist. I, I was overheard in a conversation somebody had. He was a band leader, and he had to fire the drum drummer. He said he was a great drummer, except he had no pres presence. In other words, he was very uh, somber on the drums. <laughs> He wasn't stoic, a crowd pleaser. Better, better, very stoic on the drums, <laughs> but one of the guys that was a real. You know, uh, showman, uh, yeah, showman sure. on there, a Gene lousy Krupa drummer, but the fact that yes, right, yeah. yeah. Well, you talk about how times change. Uh, Gene Krupa, his career was ruined by what he have. They caught yeah. him with one joint or something. Right, that oh, wouldn't even joint. make the news yeah. today. Sounds yeah. like Robert Mitchum. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, yeah. Oh, that wouldn't even make the news. Yeah. What a joint! Yeah, yeah so Mitchum was in jail days for one or something. Joint. Yeah. 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 Wasn't there another early singer? Maybe a contemporary of Crosby, Russ Colombo. Oh, yeah, oh, sure. Russ In Columbo. fact, uh, I think Crosby, yeah. Ron could probably tell you more than I know, but I think Crosby patterned his voice after Russ Colombo. And Russ Colombo died. He shot a, I think on New Year's Eve, shot a, a gun and it hit the ceiling and bounced back and hit him in the head and killed him instantly. Oh, yeah. And uh, then be, that's why Bing Crosby became and famous Frank after that. Sure. Bing Crosby with the Bing crooners, yeah, the ages yeah. of crooners with sure. uh, Perry Como. Sure. Well, that was later. That yeah, was 20 was years later. Singing later. Barber. Yeah, yeah the, the, the crooners, though. You know, basically, yeah. what a monitor. Sure. Or something you can focus on when you're watching. Yeah, Frank Sinatra out, right? is a crooner to some degree. The barroom type. Interesting voice. Oh, oh. I'm sorry. And the, uh, right. We'll be right back after these messages of interest and importance. Seventh inning stretch. Is it the seventh inning? Are we ready? I get the little ready. boys will be for it. Do you need a carpet for your living room, dining room, bedroom, den, family room, or even your outdoor patio? Well, the place to go for a great deal is Carpet Warehouse, which is located at 4300 West Montrose Avenue in Chicago, or you can call the Carpet Warehouse at area code 773-283-0100.
So remember, friends, if you need a great deal on any carpeting you might need for your living room, dining room, bedroom, den, family room, or even your outdoor patio, go to Carpet Warehouse. They are located at 4300 West Montrose Avenue in Chicago. Their phone number is 773-283-0100. And they are just east of Cicero Avenue or the Kennedy Expressway on the north side of the street on Montrose Avenue. Carpet Warehouse, 4300 West Montrose Avenue. You can call 773-283-0100 for a great, great deal on any carpeting you may need. Now back to our show. And here we are. We're trying to hold that thought from before. We're talking about big bands and vocalists, and a couple of things came up and to cross my mind. Does everyone remember WNIB in Chicago, 97.1? Saturday night, they used to have a show called the Dick Lawrence Review, which he would go to a certain period of time. Do all the music and talk about a personality. Somebody of the just gave me a hundred cassette tapes of that show. <laughs> really? I've got them at home oh, somewhere. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh can oh, you? Oh. Wow. And Dick yeah. Buckley was on with his jazz show on WNIB yeah. too. Well, well, he was also, but he would like he, uh, Russ Colombo. He did Russ Colombo's mm-hmm. story once, sure, yeah. and that was in, in, between his narration. He had such a beautiful voice to read it. He would play music from the era. I remember he did um, he did something about General Tom Thumb, Russ Colombo. Uh, I, I those are two that come to mind. And um, it never never showed up since then. But we need to, we need to, if we could work something out there. John might be interested in copying them. Uh, and the other one was um, how many? It turns out how many different actors started out as band singers? Would you believe Raymond Burr was a band singer? No, never, we never uh, knew Ken that. Curtis Festus Ken Curtis? had been a band yeah, singer. Yeah. yeah. No, Raymond anybody? Burr. That's. And I Ozzie some, Nelson was a band leader. Yeah, oh, yeah. he was a lo- he was a law school. He he was uh, he p- passed the bar, but it was more lucrative to have the, the orchestra at the time. His, his singer was Harriet Hilliard. Harriet Hilliard, yeah. which would, that was not her real they name. Married. That was a stage name. Was it? No, that would, even that was not her real name. Boy, well, her real name was Nelson later, huh? Yeah. So she was full Nelson then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a state. Harriet Hilliard was a stage name. I don't recall yeah. what her real name was, but it wasn't Hilliard. Yeah. Well, it's Harriet, though, wasn't it? I don't think Harriet was even. <laughs> and Doris name. Day. Don't forget Doris Day. Oh, yeah, Doris yeah. Mary Kappel Ann Hoff von von Kappelhoff. Yeah. Doris. Yeah. Well, Mary no, she Ann. She started as a dancer. Kappelhoff. They said. Uh, the other one was Mary Livingston had changed she her. Injured name. her ankle. I know, she was a Sadie Marks was her name. Yeah, Sadie yeah, right. Marks. Yeah. yeah. George George Burns marries this Irish Catholic girl, but Jack wouldn't do that, so he had to have a Jewish wife. So. Benny Kabelski, I mean, Jack Benny. Yeah. But, uh, Wasn't there a Phil Spitalini in his all-girls band? Sure. I had that yeah. right, y'all. Yeah, Mary Livingston, she, she, she legally changed her name after a while, you yeah. hmm. Well, the, the whole premise of uh, uh, around uh, Some Like It Hot was the fictionalized version of the St. Valentine's Massacre, and they sure. flee no. with the girls' band, right? That's right. The Which was, girls band. that's my, my daughter, the Michelle, Young, that's her favorite comedy. Yeah. And she was born in 75, so but yeah. And not just girls. You got uh, local people that <coughs> got their start with the big bands, just like uh, Jack Brickhouse. He was an announcer. What was he? For the big band broadcasts. Hmm. I've got one and of him doing... Did, like, what did Brickhouse do, though? Yeah, he did a broadcast out of the Blackhawk restaurant. No, I mean, Ron, Ron, uh, a- any noteworthy Chicagoans who came out of the big band era, whether as vocalists or uh, that we would know? <coughs> Ooh. Hard to think of any you know, vocalists. A lot, of, a lot of them got their start here. Brickhouse ever came yeah, across a Pier band. Six well, brawl? Well, Benny Goodman, Benny Benny Goodman, 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 Goodman,
<laughs> yeah, he used to. Re I read tell the story the on my uh, video shows that uh, Lawrence Welk would not let anybody in the band or singers use cue cards, and he mm. always used cue cards. Yeah. And he did the music from World War. Yeah, and he would introduce Duke Ellington's "Take a, the A Train," and he'd forget the A, so he would say "Take a Train," and it happened <laughs> more than once. Take a train. <laughs> Take a train. Thank you, boys. <laughs> well, the other guy that was bad about cue cards was Jack Benny. He uh, he was very precise. And no ad libbing on his program except for him. He was the only one allowed sure. to ad lib. The rest of it was all staged. Wow. He played the violin too. Yeah. Well, he got a big laugh. It was out pretty good actually, he, wasn't he? he really? Nelson mentioned oh, yeah. Drew Poussin. Yeah. He slipped, and then that was a big laugh, a big group. He used to. Drew Drewson. Yeah. <laughs> he said yeah. he could. He start laughing. He start be on the floor laughing. He would literally fall down from laughing. Yeah. Yeah. There's Particularly George, George Burns. George Burns could Perfect. break him well, up. We just yeah. mentioned Lawrence Welk. There's two or three shows, and I think they're on YouTube, of Lawrence Welk and Jack Benny. Uh, they were on guests on each other's shows. Yeah. And they wound up ad-libbing with each other. Yeah. And they, you know, Lawrence Welk looked so wooden on his shows, but when he was with Jack Benny on Jack's show, he was like the, you know, happiest uh, wow. spur-of-the-moment guy. And they were just ad-libbing and having fun and joking. You could tell they were kind of reading cue cards and just making up their own stuff too there, so uh, there were people from his early life who said that they knew lawrence walk before he had an accent oh <laughs> that's a long time ago <laughs> now i was going to say he was born here but was on the yeah. farm or something in it's strasburg north, Dak north dakota north in the Dakota, german north area yeah. it was, uh, they all spoke north, yeah. german yeah and his whole family called him a doom cough and said you're never going to mount anything and he's was the most success he's been on the air now for like 64 years on tv alone just tv and uh I understand he died with a hundred million dollars in the bank, and they built the the theater in Branson for fifty million. So there's still fifty but left. But that's gone now, isn't he it? He was just the uh, still there. It's no, it's still there. It's still it still there. Is still They're there. using it for the Oak Ridge Boys. Now. No, no. What I mean is, it's no longer. There's no longer a well performers that they're they're there are they're there at christmas time yeah the lennon yeah. sisters they and do? everything yeah, yeah still a little bit it's a sh the whole branson thing is a shadow of what it used to be yeah. but uh, okay. lawrence there's a book i've got and they, they sent me the Welk. i've got to know a lot of the Welk people and they sent me an autograph book it's, it was written for a doctoral thesis and it's called lawrence Welk and uh, american institution and it's about how, he, how he's the most successful businessman one of the most mm. successful businessmen ever in america and he came from nothing and just had, the, I mean, at one time he had this gigantic orchestra with, you know, nine violins and cellos. You're supposed to have five saxophones in the big band. He had six. He had five trumpets instead of four. It was just huge. And all these singers. And uh, it was all because he wanted to please the audience. And mm -hmm. Ron, Ron Smolin is here. He's one of the few people living today that we all like to still please the audience. A lot of musicians play for themselves. But when you please the audience, you're more successful. You know, Steve, I'll tell you. Every Saturday night up in Wisconsin, uh, out of the uh, Channel 10, the public television station up there, at 7 until 8 o'clock, they play Lawrence Wilk. Yeah. Well, here, Channel 56 for the Northwest Indiana. We get it all the time. PBS, yeah. they have it. And then uh, the station out of Indiana, uh, yeah. Channel 21 or Channel 22, I forget which one it was, That's they right. were playing uh, Lawrence Wilk on Saturday nights also. Well, Lawrence well, the other music they have. Yeah. He started in 1951 at the Aragon, and he only played at the Aragon, at, this is in California, to do a favor for the owner. He said, I'll play here for four weeks. I owe you a favor. And it just turned out they were starting with the TV. And he did it. I talked to the actual musicians who were there in 1951. They're gone now. But they told me that they played the first night. There was like 50 people in the audience. And it was broadcast on TV. And the next week they showed up. 5,000 people showed up. They said it was the most amazing thing you've ever seen in your lifetime. And uh, that was the beginning. And Myron Florin was playing a duet with Lawrence Welk on 12th Street Rag, and he said that's the moment he knew this would last more than a year or two. And it lasted 32 years. Did Welk ever over. comment publicly on what he thought of Stan Freeberg's parody? Oh, yes. Uh, my favorite story <laughs> I tell. Uh, Rocky yeah. Rockwell was... Uh, a well, trumpet Stoney player well, right? was a trumpet player with Lawrence Welk, and uh, Stan Freeberg called him on that record, Stony Stonewell. So I got to be friends with Rocky Rockwell. He'd been at my house three times. When he would send me letters, he would sometimes sign it Stony. So his favorite story, which I told on Chuck Shaden's show recently, uh, uh, Steve Darnell's show, uh, Rocky was, this is 1957 when the Stan Freeberg record came out, and he said Lawrence was standing in his office looking out the window at the traffic and saying, I don't like that record, they make fun of me. <laughs> and Rocky says, Lawrence, your theme song is on that record, every time they play it you get a royalty payment. And he said Lawrence looked back out the window and said, 
I think I like that record. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> Gee, I got to mention, I wrestled at the Oregon Ballroom. Uh, uh, gee, I'm nobody cares, do they? <laughs> I was at the Aragon Ballroom one time. Uh, oh. I saw well, some kind of record, but uh, I, I got in the back there, and you always, I always love to see you know the movies. They show these big dressing rooms and everything else. You go back to the Aragon there. If you're lucky, you can turn around in one of those dressing rooms. They got a little table there for your <coughs> case, and you had to go outside to close the door. <laughs> The show business is not as glamorous as it looks yeah. on the You know, Lawrence Welk played at the Palladium in Hollywood, and everybody I talked to said, you know, the Palladium looks just gigantic, beautiful ballroom. They said when you go in the dressing rooms, and they said it wasn't, it wasn't good. And I used to play at the Melody Mill Ballroom in Chicago, and they had like a little booth where the announcers would be. And we would we'd play six hours sometimes and take 20-minute breaks, and there's nothing to do. We'd go in this little room for a break and there was just sawdust on the floor and you're just sitting there and uh, yeah. you know it's, it's not glamorous like it looks on TV. No. What do you suppose would be the big I mean uh, I, I have a theory maybe with Lawrence Welk with the fact that okay maybe he sounded or foreign and he was a little bit non-professional of his presentation but with sincerity was well, for that's real. what made him famous because at the same time the Welk show was on you can see the video tapes videos on uh, YouTube uh, I've got a lot of the old actual videos of the Ray Anthony show. So Ray Anthony was very polished, big band, and it was on a, an hour before Lawrence Welk. And here's Ray Anthony talking, you know, like this polished person, and it lacked the sincerity. It was like a big nothing. And then here, Lawrence Welk, he was like everybody's father or right, grandfather. Right. Yeah, and he right. comes on with the accent, and it was just so warm. Mm -hmm. And that's what the whole thing is. It's yeah. all about attitude, you know, and, what and you warm. What you see is what you get, maybe, or, you know? Yeah, that too. I don't know. It's it's very interesting when you compare both those shows. You my know. sister and myself would alternate grandma sitting on Saturday night. They live right near us. I know. My yeah. mother's mother. <laughs> and uh, uh, I would could walk home. I was only 10. But I, my aunt and uncle would give me two bucks. Grandma gave me a half a buck. She liked to watch <laughs> Pee Wee King, Lawrence Welk, and Rustling from the Marigold at the time. So, wow. And she, she really was an old like country crazy. German lady. And uh, Hans Schmidt had her fooled into thinking he was really German, you know. Wrestler, I mean. And there was also a show on TV uh, in the early 60s that was on right after or before Lawrence Welk, and Ron may remember this, Dick Sinclair's Polka Party. Yeah. And that was similar to Welk because it was like a musical family. You get to know everybody on the show. You get to know their names. And it was just, everything's yeah, about there's joy. A, there's, you a want? A there's a Molly B. Oh, Molly B's my Molly, favorite. Yeah, yeah, my that's, favorite that's, person that's of all time. saw her last oh, night. Yeah. 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 You no, saw her last night, too? On the video. Oh, oh you're doing good. Yeah, weird. No, 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 yeah. Doing my research. Molly yeah. B was great. She was just a big star, and she How just had a lot of enthusiasm. Yeah, the, the, old, the, old polka, the old polka, uh, uh, ba the Baby Doll Polka Club. Oh, yeah. And played, the, her, uh, played her quite yeah. a few times. Bob Eddie, Lewandowski, Eddie remember? Eddie Carosa. Yeah. 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 Eddie, Eddie Carosa Jr. and the, yeah. bo wow. the boys from Illinois. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they had, uh, yeah. Tom, they had that uh, polka f Hall of Fame on Kedzie around. What was that, around north of Archer a little bit there? They it was on Kedzie. You know? Yeah. Are they still there? That was the International Polka Association. It was at that. It was an old union hall, mm -hmm. uh, 44th and Kedzie. Right, okay. Right. Well, they sold that now, and uh, everything is inside Polonia Banquet Hall on well, Archer there? Avenue. Okay. Yes. See. Yes. I don't know if they've got all the displays set up or not, but that's where everything's located now. Mm -hmm. Wasn't uh, Wayne King <coughs> big for a while on Chicago TV in the early 50s? The Walsh King, Wayne King. Am I Not kidding? just for a while, for a long time. Yeah. Here yes. Here. I recently heard a recording, I believe it was Franklin McCormick making a presentation at the time of Wayne King's retirement from music. Something like it wasn't that. Wayne King's retirement, it was the retirement, actually the closing of the Aragon. That's in right. 1964. Right. Mr. Right. DeVita was there that oh, night. You were there? Yes. Right. Just saw right. yes. yes. Frank yeah. McCormick. yesterday, and they had like 5,000 people in the audience. That's and right. Yes. There's the, uh, you can find the tapes on the internet. I have it. All over Sherry. I have it. The I, Wayne I, King's I, final performance. I was there that night. This hand shook. Franklin McCormick, Cliff Mercer, and Wayne King. Cliff Kane. Mercer was the announcer. That's yes. right. That's right. I was there that night, and I have all kinds of tapes. I had my, my pal on a, on a reel-to-reel -reel recorded at home while I was at the Aragon. And and there's I have all kinds of, of, of recordings of, of the final broadcast of the Aragon Ballroom. Yeah, it was fantastic. And I'll tell you... 
Well, I met Wayne. I met uh, Frank McCormick up at uh, the Wisconsin Dells. He used to go up to Uphoff's restaurant, and he uh, used to broadcast the whole month of July up up there to bring people up to Wisconsin Dells for Tommy Bartlett. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, then we then I, I I sat with him many times, and then we had the the uh, the, the doings at the Aragon Ballroom, the uh, uh, the final broadcast of from the Aragon Ballroom. And then about, oh, maybe about um, whenever it was, I don't remember the exact time, but one day I happened to go to the firehouse behind Wrigley Field, Engine 78, and they have a fire ambulance in there. And they sent the ambulance over to WGN Studios for, uh, for a heart attack. So the guy says, come on, John, get the ambulance and ride with us. We go over there. The guys are standing out there in the parking lot, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And we ran in there. They took us into the studio. And who was laying on the floor? Franklin McCorpick. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yep. Not only did I shake the man's head, but a short time after that, I helped carry him out of the studio's dead. Unbelievable. Oh. So every time, and right there on this, on this rack right here, I have Wayne King, uh, uh, Lawrence Welk up there, uh, Jan Garber. Mm. Uh, I got all kinds. Frank McCormick. How, why do I, uh, uh, you know, his his theme song? How much, uh, do, I how much do I love the ad? That's all right there on on that rack right there. I've got I've got them all. Uh, Frank McCormick was quite a uh, cruiser on uh, midnight radio. He was. Uh, oh, yeah. He would he would come on he would come on WGN at eleven o'clock. 11 o'clock until 5 o'clock in the morning. He wove kind of a spell, didn't he? It was yes. kind of a mood. Yes. And, mm-hmm. yes. and those yeah. people, Ken Nordeen was like that, too. Yeah. That's somebody mm-hmm. else yeah. you probably remember. <coughs> Bill Grisky <laughs> tried to do something like that yeah. for a while. Don't you remember that? Bill Grisky? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And on Saturday night, So at the last night of the Aragon, were the people dancing or just kind of standing there? There was the, It looked like they were so thick with people. I tell you... Steve, you couldn't get a shoehorn between people, yeah. and even if you were listening, if you were to listen to the, to it, uh, 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 Cliff Mercer would say, "Well, uh, dancing and listening, nobody is dancing because you can't." If because he's exactly said that he says uh, you're enjoying the listening and dancing while dancing you can't because there are so many people in this ballroom that they yeah. they, they, they could not. Oh. I played at the Aragon <coughs> three times in the last fifteen years. They mm-hmm. rent it out for private parties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it looks yeah. exactly the same, but they won't let you use the stage anymore. You have to set up in front of the stage because it's it's very rickety. They don't want to spend yeah. the money to fix it. But the ballroom looks exactly yeah, the yes. same. And I tell people there's still no now, place to park your car. Right right <laughs> around right around uh, Melvina and. Eddie, there was a, a, a gentleman that had that organ enthusiastic group or something, and they used to play at different organs, uh, different mm. uh, places. Bill Rieger. Yeah, exactly, Ron, yes. And many times I went to the Aragon Ballroom, and in fact, well, Ron, I gave you the tapes to, yeah. to listen to. Uh, Tony. Yeah, uh, they had uh, Tony Barron, Steve Anthony, and, and, and then there was the uh, the uh, organ enthusiasts or this, this, this group, and then I, the one that I really... Is El Hel Peril uh, when he would play up at that mighty Wardens of Oregon up there? That was fantastic, fantastic. Now, I've played at the Aragon about five times, mm-hmm. but the first time we played there was our own dance that we actually promoted there, and that was 1973. We actually got in about 250, 300 people, but uh, in the size of the Aragon, 250 people, 300 people, <laughs> it's like seeing three people in John's office. It's it's yeah, not how many times have they threatened to tear that place down? They won't. They yeah, won't. No, but they, they threatened several times. Steve talked about the stage. The stage is fixed now. Is it? Oh, yeah. They oh, would, it is. Yeah. You, originally, when, when, the, when the Aragon was in, 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 in business, you had two stages. The, the, the lower stage was for the quote-unquote name band that came in out of town. That was about four steps up off, off the dance floor. Right. So you were real low. Then you had, just behind them, probably about six feet up, you had a second stage. And that's where there was a little band shell up there that helped the acoustics go out. And that's where the house band usually set up. What they did, when we played there, we still had the original stages. And on either either side of the stage, you had waterfalls and little water fountains. And one time in the middle of, I've seen pictures of it in the middle, right in the middle of the dance floor, there used to be a water fountain there too. 
But now what they have done, because it's all rock and roll concerts and everything, to keep the quote-unquote audience from getting up and either attacking the musicians or joining the musicians or doing something weird over there, the front of the stage looks like the front of an old diesel or an old steam engine. It is, it's rounded like slightly, a like a cow catcher. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, I couldn't, have, well, it could be um, plastic for all I know on it right now, but it's, you cannot crawl on it. There's no way to get any traction up that thing. And if you're trying to, by the time you get even two or three steps up, there's enough security they, to stop you. The barbed wire would probably uh, Well, yeah. But that, but the top of that stage is actually about a foot and a half to two feet over the original rear upper stage, and the entire stage reaches out in front of the original stage that was the lower level. So you're now out farther. By doing that, if you were to set up with a big band up on that stage, you'd have to set all the way back to get any acoustics. Oh. Yes, my friend Tony Barron played there. He played up on the upper stage, and the acoustics. They were okay, but it was not you. You by by building that new stage, you already had the acoustics were ruined in that place. Mm. Okay. So a lot, a lot of the bands do set up there. The last time we played there, we played for a it was a high school reunion. They rented out the entire Aragon Ballroom. They had their high school reunion there. It was a class of nineteen, I think forty three or forty four. Monte Fiore or <laughs> I don't know which. Well, I don't recall which school it was, but we 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 played in front of the stage on 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 the dance floor because it was the easiest place to set up at, and uh, the acoustics were okay, but we did the best we could in there. Mm -hmm. But that's what a lot of people do. They'll, they'll have their private party there to run a cater, get a caterer to bring the food in. And they were pr promoting prize fights a few years ago there. But <laughs> there's been prize True. fights, not like not. like you said, wrestling. Yeah. It was, yeah. it was uh, roller skating. Yeah. It was uh, rock and roll. <laughs> when, uh, th when the Aragon changed hands, it became the Cheetah. Right. And, yeah, and, right. and yeah. everything inside was either covered with white cloth or whitewashed. Hmm. And one, one of the saddest things I saw, this goes well, probably within the last five years I was over there. And I knew, I knew a gentleman who used to be the caretaker of the building. And I went in there for some business reason, and, and then I saw Brian there. And Brian was walking around with me, and it was a Monday. And it was right after a dance, well, not a dance, but probably a concert. Hispanic concert, and I was watching the workers in that beautiful dance floor. You saw 25 guys with coal shovels oh. shoveling beer cups oh. into garbage cans, literally sweeping them up into a pile and shoveling them off the dance floor, these beer cups. And to me, that, that was sacrilege. Until it was explained to me, you got to think of it this way. That might be sacrilege to some, but that's every cup was $8 yeah. no, at it. spent mm -hmm. towards the promoter. And we remember just a few years ago before our city's finances were admitted to be so terrible, Mayor Emanuel was talking about making the Uptown <coughs> Riviera and the... Uh, yeah, uh, the Fine Arts Center, the North, our Center for the North Side. That whole area is, is what they should do with that, just like they did in Indianapolis with the Indiana Roof. They saved the theater building, which the Indiana Roof Ballroom is up on top. I was there probably about 1985 or so. It was the only building left for urban renewal in downtown Indianapolis, just the Indiana Roof. If you go there now, it's all fixed. There's buildings all over. Right next to it, attached to the ballroom, is an Embassy Suites Hotel. So when they have events over there, you got the hotel right next to it. Yeah. They did wonders with that place. And the and the uh, the Indiana roof is identical to the Aragon. It's two thirds the size of the Aragon, though, so it's a little smaller. But right now, any of us can go there, have a picnic on the floor of that place, and not be afraid to eat. Mm. That's how clean and spotless that place is. Mm. Are you talking about the Aragon now? No, that's the embassy. No, that's the uh, the uh, Indiana roof. Okay. Aragon is another th another thing they did. Now the acoustics in the Aragon are going to be different, even if if you play there, Steve. Because to reduce some of the sound, the Aragon was set up acoustically. You only needed two mics, really, a vocal mic and a mic on the piano. 
if you had any other mics on, on the band or anything, you were just too loud in that place. And now with all the rock and roll bands in there, uh -huh. well, they're bringing all this amplification and everything. Halfway in the middle of the ballroom, what they did is it's probably about a 25-foot drape that goes right across the entire perimeter, the, the half of the ballroom. So the, the stage would be facing, the stage faces what? Faces, the stage faces north. Yeah, the stage faces north because the stage is right by Lawrence Avenue. So you're looking north. So halfway in, in the ballroom, they got this big drape hanging down. It doesn't come all the way down, but it's just enough, and it absorbs some of the sound. Yeah, the uh, f funny story along with that, we were at the concert at uh, Chicago Theater, and they had the acoustics on there. And then it was uh, Phil Ponce's kids. Uh, I forgot what it's called. Uh, but anyways... At the end, they went like acapella without the sound system. We heard them better yeah. without the sound system than with the sound system. You know, the sound system just blurred everything out. I couldn't hear a damn thing. And when they they went acapella, there it was great. You know, <coughs> beautiful music. Yeah. You know, nice sound. And Funny else. you should mention, Al. A uh, number of years ago, I was with a group. We were at a uh, one of the police associations. One of the for black officers had. Um, um, Duke Ellington's band with his son, Mercer Ellington, and doing it. And this was out at the Lexington House on 95th Street in o on, uh, Oak Lawn. They originally had the microphone system on. They didn't need it. They cut it all off because that did not need any more amplification. Much yeah, it did. That's, uh, you've got uh, three or four places that are really <laughs> great about that. Uh, you go out to uh, the Auditorium Theater, you don't need any sound system there at all because uh, right, you can hear a whisper. Yeah, it's very yeah. Nice. yeah. Ron and I used to play at the Hub Ballroom near uh, Peoria. Yes, and I remember the we didn't even need. I've never seen it was built like a megaphone, and it burned down now. But uh, it was some of the best sound I've ever heard in my life, and it was just totally effortless. You could hear the piano, no microphones at all. We just we, the only thing we had was a vocal mic, and yeah. we had a mic on the piano. So as long uh, as we're talking about the ballrooms, Ron and I still play at the Willowbrook, which for those of you listening mm -hmm. in Radio Land used to be called the O Henry a long time ago. And uh, Ron, you want to say a few words? They've I thought they've kept it up very nice, and they still have the floating dance floor. It's beautiful in there. If you have a chance to come, it's they have ballroom dancing, big band ballroom dancing every Sunday at the uh, Willowbrook. And uh, dancing usually goes on from 2 to 4.30. Which is where? <coughs> Willowbrook is located at 8900 South Archer Avenue. So if you just go straight Old out Archer Avenue. Old Archer Road, yeah. Yeah, you'll hit it. You'll and hit it. Uh, this, that? it this, this Willow Springs. What's it, about a mile west of yeah. Mannheim? Yeah. yeah. Uh, about two, two uh, four, four miles east of 80, Route 83 and about three miles west of Mannheim. Mannheim, yeah. 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 Uh, the other place that had uh, great acoustics was we went out to uh, Salt Lake City with the uh, Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Choir. Oh, sure. Yeah. And that's the same thing. You drop a pin and you can hear it any place yeah. in, the, in the building. The, uh, the Willowbrook's struggling just a little bit right now because they, they need to get more people out there. And the one thing I what I heard is they cannot get listed on the National Historic Landmarks because whatever remodeling was done on the entrance kind of did something to the building. Mm -hmm. So they don't get no support that way. So all the support is people coming out and supporting any live events. And they have live events all the time. They have they still have boxing. Mm -hmm. They they've had the the, uh, w the what's that new one where they uh, fight inside the octagon? <coughs> mixed martial arts. Mar yeah, yeah. that uh, MMA. They have that out there. They have country dances. They have. I don't know if they have polka dances yet. But we're talking about that. Uh, but uh, they they have DJs. He can dance out there. Do a DJ too. Boom. And I know a guy who's a, who's a bartender there. I can't think of his name now. Though he's a retired fireman. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I had it. Had that. Now when are you there, Steve? You you're coming up. I'll be there October twenty fifth. Which is next? Oh, this week! Yeah. I have to start getting sure my is. music in order. It takes me <laughs> ten to fifteen hours just to get my music in order for every ballroom joke. Thanks for reminding me because I have a, a doctor's appointment, oh. the twenty third. So, <laughs> a shrink used to be four nights a week at the Willow at the uh, Willowbrook, yeah. and we'd play for two weeks, so we'd have eight jobs a month, and now it's one day a month for Rich. each fan. Now for another brief intermission. You've been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians, and we thank you for it. <coughs>
Well, friends, guess what? We're in the month of October, and it won't be long that white stuff will be coming out of the skies known as snow. Now, how is the roof on your home? Is your roof and your gutters in good shape? You know, it's a long winter, and we can have a lot of snow, and you don't want to have problems with your roof. You don't want your crawl space or your attic to have mildew or any kind of uh, dampness inside during the winter months. And the best thing to do to check your roof, gutters, siding, and whatever is to give Mike Best, Best Brothers Roofing, a call and have them come out and look at your roof siding and gutters. You can call Mike Best at area code 630-616-1359. And like I said, you don't want mildew or mold in your attic or crawl space. Or you don't want drip, drip, drip on the ceilings in your rooms or have walls damaged by a leaky gutter or bad siding. So don't have double expense Sooner or later, it's got to get taken care of. So give, give Mike a call at area code 616-1359. Mike Best will drive over in a shiny, beautiful pickup truck with ladders on top and Best Brother roofing signs on the doors. He will look at your roof siding and gutters, give you an estimate, and you go from there. So once again, friends, don't have double expense. Have your roof, siding, and gutters taken care of before the bad weather hits. You can call Mike Besh at area code 630-616-1359. He's very reasonable, and they, they do beautiful work. I guarantee you, you will be satisfied. So once again, Best Brothers Roofing, Siding, and Gutters at area code 630-616-1359. Now back to our show. Well, we're back from break, and we have to bid a fond farewell. Steve Cooper has to leave Steve. for another engagement. Steve, I want to thank you for showing and Thanks, Steve. contributing so much to the show. And hope you can come back sometime, well, thank anytime you, you wish. Thank you thanks for, uh, to Ron, you, you, you introduced Steve to the show? Yes. You, you're a talent scout today? Actually, he, he knew about this show. He just never came out before. Relative of Ken Little. Yes. Oh, that's right, yeah. That's right. Hey, guys, who, who, who was Little the prize then? Yeah. Who was yeah. the finder's fee? <laughs> What I say. There'll be a little more in your envelope. He's, he's going to take me off for White Castles later. I was going to stop there. <laughs> the porcelain room, huh? Okay, okay, gang. We've had a pretty good... Anything more on music? We have uh, we pretty much touched on an awful lot here. Uh, I gotta, before we go, i got to ask Steve. Steve, before you leave, Steve, you just talk into this mic just for a second. Oh, okay, I can stay another minute. Yeah, what was the acoustics? What, 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 do you th what do you remember about the acoustics at the Milford? Was it that was it? That was just a, that was a nice small hall. It didn't take much effort. Yes, to play no, there. same thing. Uh, and I played at the Embassy on Fullerton, mm -hmm. which the acoustics were fine, and the Holiday Ballroom uh, near Jefferson Park. I remember that it was a little harder to fill, but it was it was all very good. Yeah, very. And the the older days, the bands didn't play that loud. Now they're loud. The sound systems are loud, but uh, yeah. People like what we call acoustic music, you know. My, my audiologist loves that because, in fact, I dressed more brains business in because they said now the kids are, uh, the used to be seniors that came in. Now they're getting to the point where they're getting fairly young. Well, that's good. Not really because that <laughs> means they can't hear oh. what they oh, Their drums are blown. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. a good point. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, you go in a car, you know, next, I, I sometimes, uh, I, I got my windows rolled up, trying to listen to my radio, and a car pulls up next to me, and I can't even hear my own radio. Yeah, don't you love that? Yeah. I like to do that when it'll be someone on the street will be playing something so loud. And I, I'll see if I roll it down, I print out whatever radio station, I turn it as loud as I can, act like I don't even aware if they look at you then, you know, like, I don't know. What I had a, my response to that, I had a uh, Nissan Maxima that had a Bose stereo, six speaker, and had a reverb. It was, I mean, when you cranked it up, it was unbelievable. So I used to keep a uh, CD of bagpipe music, <laughs> and when I pulled up next to the for the cars that you're playing, and I look at them, and I put it in, and I crank my stereo up and hit it, and man, I'm telling you, it got their attention. As I'm shaking this gentleman's hand right here, I do the same thing. I got a couple polka tapes, oh, a couple guy Lombardo same, tapes same, in my car, thing, right, and I roll down my windows same and do the same thing. But, you know, when, when you're next to it, I was at a gas station, and a car was rattling. It's so loud. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's unbelievable. It's not good for your health. It's no. bad right. for your bones. It's bad for everything. <laughs> but it's so it's so worth it. Have a cookie yeah, on your okay. way out. Thank you. <laughs> okay, gang. Uh, let, let's. Uh, we, are we any any loose ends on this music or? Uh, uh, your favorite holiday is coming up. Music. It's unbelievable. A couple weeks. Who me? Yeah, well, Halloween. Halloween. My birthday's two days after it. That's why it's my favorite. Mm -hmm. Oh, then you got the. <laughs> You gotta uh, fall back on your clock. For that's right. Spring forward, fall back. That's uh, right. For those people that turn their clock ahead in the spring, that is. <laughs> you know where the standard time idea came from, don't you? It was all railroads. The railroads, yeah. exactly. Because yeah. you know, it was who, life and start, death for them. Who started daylight savings time? Don't you? Um, a Scotsman in front of a pay uh, toilet. Uh, uh, I don't know. Benjamin Franklin. Really? Benjamin Franklin? Yeah. He, he advocated he getting up earlier because of the fact that, you know, save more daylight time. And then also got real popular it's during the wars because of the fact that the yeah. uh, had more daylight. And uh, consequently, they called it wartime. They yeah. had it all, it was called like Eastern wartime, or yeah. Central mm -hmm. wartime. Well, remember uh, the, during the Carter years? We tried it year round once? I try to forget the Carter yeah, years yeah. as much as. No, but I mean, do you remember I'm that, just, though? I'm just People kidding. think I'm lying about it. We tried year round. Yeah. What's the well, sense? It's not even bright. You're up. We have a national malaise. Mm. Uh, it's terrible. I, I, I travel the country and people don't recognize who I am. Mm. Who said that? That's why I always carry American Express. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Mala I don't like malaise. I like ketchup. Oh, you go up to Alaska and there's Alaskan time. They got four time periods up there. Four? Mm -hmm. Really? No, and it's they, just Alaska just time. Pardon? There's just a, there's a time zone called Alaska time. That's because of the fact they had so many time periods going through there. It just got confusing uh, that they I just. just oh, you're talking about at some point in the past they had. Yeah, yeah. yeah they just yeah, created they one couple. one central time there. Well, let's go back to ballrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Northwest the, side ballrooms. We talked the about street. the <laughs> Milford, the Embassy, and the Holiday. Any any other one, or is that pretty much it? Aragon, the, the, the Trianon. What was that? That was Southside. Southside. Tree and I was at 62nd in Cottage right. Grove. It's gone. Okay. Yeah. Companion That's to Eric, I believe. Yeah. I think 1967. That one got knocked down. Oh. Then and the uh, names I remember hearing about, I never knew anything about them. Now Steve was telling me that the uh, ballrooms did not have in-house bands, but maybe every couple of weeks they would rotate. And, uh, bring a local band. Yeah, local bands, yeah. Yeah, local bands right. The Tree and I takes its name from one of the little out palaces at Versailles in France. The, huh. great, the great palace of Versailles. There is the Grand Trianon and, the, and the, the Little Trianon, which were sort of like smaller subsidiary palaces of Versailles. So that's where the, where the, the name comes from, of the, the Trianon Ballroom. There's a, sis there's a sister ballroom in Milwaukee. It's called, it was originally called the Eagles Million Dollar Ballroom on Wisconsin Avenue. Eagle Club? Eagle Club in Milwaukee on Wisconsin Avenue. What were you there Avenue. for, music or wrestling? I, I played there. Back, uh, yeah. let's see, what was it, uh, 60, no, 80. They had wrestling there, too. 87 or 88, yeah, they had wrestling. Many years. So you were, not, you were upstairs in the ballroom when you wrestled? Yeah. Okay. I didn't, I didn't wrestle, I was there. Okay, the, the actual ballroom on the, on the top floor, the million-dollar ballroom, hmm. is another one that's about two-thirds the size of the actual Triana. It looks just like the Triana. Does it? Hmm. Yeah, it's still up there. And Any ballrooms on the uh, near northwest suburbs? 
You had yeah. one that was built in the 70s, and that was Lancer's Steakhouse. Ooh, sounds and familiar. And that was on uh, Route 62, a about, about two, three miles northwest of uh, Route 53. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, it was a steakhouse in front, and the back was a uh, <coughs> banquet hall s- segment. They had banquet halls on, on the first floor, and they had a big ballroom on the second floor. And the same bands that worked the circuit at the embassy and then the Milford played over at the Lancer. Oh. Freddie Mills and Teddy Lee. And I believe Norm Ladd, was, who was one of the band leaders, had something to do with the building of that place. But talking about the Milford ballroom that you just mentioned, part of the Milford ballroom still exists today. In uh, 19, I think it was, really, it was I think it was around 86. The last fire took place upstairs there. The ballroom closed down actually about uh, late 70s. It sat for a while, then it, it got refurbished, and it was a couple different, like a Polish restaurant, a Polish nightclub. Hmm. Then the the entire um, uh, place had a big fire, and the roof collapsed, and it sat there for a year, so they knocked it down. But when they knocked it down, they retained the north wall that is on Pulaski and the east wall which is along the alley and those two walls are retained because there's some kind of a uh, a tax thing that you can get a tax write off or a tax <laughs> rebate in Chicago that if you leave part of the existing walls up and build a new structure yeah. you can you know, right. and, you, and you also ah. don't have to in total in total new can Total new construction requires parking, yeah. so if you leave uh-huh. a certain percentage ah, up, uh, you can get it. You can get around that. Yeah. So there's a new structure that which a new incorporates structure. these, re- these right. Right. remaining walls of these. Right. Right. Yeah, with so some so kind of auto. You get around two or three different things. Yeah. Well, if you build like a new ballroom, you would have to uh, meet the uh, parking, parking requirements. You'd have to yeah. have like well, a it's just parking like lot for 500 cars yeah. or whatever. It's just like building a mansion on an old foundation. It's called a renovation, not a new building. Yeah. Now, so, so the ballroom was on the second floor, so that's all gone. But the theater, which was the Milford Theater, mm-hmm. which was underneath, that's the walls that are actually retained right there. And if you go through the alley right behind there, it's a CVS now. You can right. see where the fire escapes were bricked in that you can see they still exist from the old theater right there. Yeah. Don't you think the Milford Ballroom the Theater once under common ownership? They started that way and they gradually drifted apart. <laughs> I'm not sure because I know a guy named Al Hawksburg owned it in the '60s. The ballroom. I don't think it. I think it was two separate <coughs> entities. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. And for some reason, they used to call it the Over Thirty Dance. Yeah. The Embassy Ballroom said the same thing: Over Thirty Dance. Mm-hmm. And I was in my 20s, early 20s, when I used to go mm-hmm. to the Embassy. And if I went into the at the, the first floor because I was young, I'd always get stared at. What are you doing? <laughs> it's it, this is our private club. Ooh. But uh, Johnny Burke, who was the owner, was always nice to me because he knows I always had the interest in the big bands, and I'd, I'd show up there every weekend. I had nothing else to do. <laughs> he, he didn't even charge me. He just says, go upstairs. <laughs> and the Embassy Ballroom, which was located on, on the south, on the northeast corner of Fullerton and Pulaski, it was the original of the, the Embassy Theater, about, about 1,200 seats. It was a pretty big place. They leveled it, uh, but the balcony still existed. So what they did is every other row of balcony seats were still there from the theater. You can sit in the actual balcony seats. And every other row that they pulled out, they had cocktail tables. And that was their little cocktail area and and the balcony upstairs. And that's where I spent many Fridays and Saturday nights listening to the bands and learning the craft, so to speak, of some of the bands that were there. Yeah, well, the uh, movie calls out and... uh Rosemont, they have a uh, fancy place out there, and you can have cocktails and stuff like that in their theater, watch some movies. Of course, it costs you, uh, you know, a few bucks extra. But uh-huh. Yeah, they've got them in, uh, one One is Hollywood Palms, one is Hollywood something, or the Hollywood Boulevard out in uh, the western suburbs in I think Naperville, or Naperville and yeah. Darien, those two places, you know, like. The new movie theaters, uh, there's a chain in Milwaukee that opened up. And they've taken some of the old movie palaces out there. You go in, 
and you you sit back in like a recliner. Yeah. And they bring the food right to you, right. your drinks yeah. right There's to you, right you watch yeah. the theater. It works out very well, actually. Yeah. I yeah. think it does. Yeah, that's the same thing. It's a good, good menu, too. Yeah. Of course, the movie call has got about a couple dozen different uh, houses there, but uh, that's their main forte is that one they want to fill up because they make the money there. Yeah. A few of the old older theaters that, you know, were, there's what, there was one in, uh, in uh, I'm going to Milwaukee now for this one. It was called the Avalon Theater. It just reopened in the design we just talked about where they serve the food mm -hmm. and everything else. But the Avalon was a, a movie palace, and we, we we were fortunate to play there in the late 90s with a, we did a show with the pipe organ with Dave Wickerham on pipe organ, and we had the band on stage. And uh, just looking at that theater, how they, to, to make money to keep it going at that time, you had the existing theater, which was the main floor on the balcony, and part of the stage where the curtain used to come down, they closed that all up, and backstage they made a second theater. And that's how they were able to design two theaters. In Chicago, they, they ruined a couple of theaters. It's back to the way it used to be now, but the Portage Theater oh, yeah. on the Milwaukee trend. Avenue. Yeah. They put they put a wall right down the middle of that place that yeah. ruined it. Yeah, yeah the uh, it's gone now. They, what they did yeah. there though the the, the Porridge Theater was used in uh, Johnny Depp's last movie with the Public Enemy, where they were showing the uh, Biograph Theater. Oh, excuse me, Al. We must have another intermission. No, 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 no. no, no I'm no, sorry. No. <laughs> no. I get so eager. Wipe that out, John. <laughs> <laughs> Rerun the go tape. Ahead, it didn't happen. Right. Okay. No, they they uh, they uh, refurbished the uh, theater with uh, seats for the uh, movie uh, Johnny Depp's uh, Public Enemy. That's right. Because the biograph was on uh, to the point where it couldn't do that. They used the external of the biograph, but the internal of uh, mm -hmm. Portage. And it's like a, a, above the uh, lobby at Portage, that used to be a. Uh, I think it was either an American Legion post or a VFW post yeah, at one time. That one. That? Then in later years, it was a uh, archery range up there. Mm -hmm. That was more recent billiard. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. archery range. Right? Uh, okay, what was the movie playing when Dillinger went to see? <laughs> Manhattan Melody. Melody. Uh, yes. Okay, what was the cartoon? <laughs> uh oh, that's, that's <laughs> trivia. <laughs> you knew something was coming there, didn't you? Yeah. And there, there was a, there was a small ballroom up in that theater also. The what? On the second floor, was a Which dance one? floor. Yeah. Biograph. The biograph. Really? There was a dance floor, a dance hall up there. If you, if you take, if you stand in front of the building, you, you can take a look. If you look at the main theater, if you just look to the to the north or just to the left of it, huh. above the restaurant, you can see the windows and you can see where the dance hall used to be up there. Ron, what are they doing with the patio? Patio is up for grabs right now, but it's being sold to uh, a new entity that's yeah. supposed to rehab it and uh, hopefully. Well, they got a they got a uh, twenty four hour gig going right now with movies for Halloween. Yeah, yeah. horror fest or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. But the, uh, yeah. The owner that what was the car? It's thing? stupid story about it. Was <laughs> the fact the owner of the building made a lot of money in the stock market. He bought the building. He died, and his son took over, and he had no idea what the hell was going on. Exactly. And consequently, <laughs> uh, the owner from the Portage took over for a short time and. That's the last I heard. Yep. Yeah, and yep. then yep. he—I'm not sure what the status of his. Well, his his, his management team kind of took over the theater. Yeah, but well, the guy know. that owns the uh, Portage is also the guy that had owned the Congress Theater. Yeah, and, and got shut out there. there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, he can't—he can't have a uh, liquor license because no. of all the fast no. problems. Where, where was the Congress? Congress, uh, uh, Elston Avenue, Milwaukee, Milwaukee Avenue, Milwaukee, 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 Milwaukee Avenue, uh, Milwaukee Avenue. Your Armitage, yeah. I would say something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned Avalon. There was an Avalon <laughs> Theater in Chicago, also southeast yeah. side of Chicago. Yeah, there were two. Two? <coughs> yes. Oh. You got the current one that's standing over there. That's, it was called something else, but now it's called the Avalon hmm. uh, along South Shore Avenue there. But there was another Avalon also. Hmm. There was a big theater called the Marlboro. Oh, Mar yeah, Bro. on West Madison, yeah. Yes, Pulaski and Madison. Right. 3,400, I think over 3,500 seats. That it came down around 1963 or 4, I remember. 64, 64. Well, anyways, yeah. uh, to go back slightly, uh, the gateway is supposed to be, if it was still existed as a gateway, it would be 100 years old right now. They're going to celebrate the sunset in Terrio. Is that the Copernicus Center now? Yep. Yeah, it's the Copernicus. Yeah. Hey, uh, it still looks pretty nice on the inside, but they took the why they took the organ out, I have no idea. 
It was a political thing. Yeah, yeah. It, the it people are stupid. <laughs> they were an organ donor. Yeah. Oh, da, 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 da. It was Jack Ryan. Ryan. That was Jack Ryan. The, the uh, <laughs> consul, the consul from that went over to the portage. Right. Hmm. The guy, the guy that owned the uh, who, who was the last manager of the uh, portage, was the manager over at Gateway, and things happened. He had to leave, so he took his organ with him. Mm-hmm. But there was a little legal barrel to get it out because the people who owned Copernicus didn't know he owned the organ. They couldn't find the paperwork, but he had the paperwork. Mm. Oh. So he got his organ out of there. And I don't know if it's still in the in the portage because he's no longer associated with yeah, the portage I, either. It, it, it's, that that uh, portage has been a real disaster as such for the last few years. Well, right now they're just doing rock concerts in there. They took yeah. a lot of the seats out and everything. That's what they did at the Congress, too. The whole main floor, they took all the seats out because they can get more people standing than they can sitting. And uh, so I don't know if they destroyed the seats or what. The seats yeah, in the balcony are still there. Well, right, is the Congress, the Congress opened up again? I don't know. No, sure. no okay, it's, it's supposedly close. under rehab, but I haven't seen anything happening there yet. Okay, then the patio, I, I do know, it has it looked pretty meager the last time I was in the place. And... Uh, the uh, yacht who uh, owned it, uh, it's, I guess the building's up for sale now or something it like that. It just got sold. Yeah. It just got sold. The, the father who owned when he the father owned it, even though the theater was sold, okay, the uh, apartments and everything else supported the property. Right. So he, he kept the theater heated so nothing would happen in, in during the wintertime. And he was constantly in there painting and fixing it up so that it looked decent if he needed to open it. And it still looks pretty good in there. It needs just a little bit of cleanup. Like we said, the organ is, is kind of need, in, the, in need of work because it yeah, hasn't it's had it's any. There. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But they also had some problem with the heating and cooling system in there, so not, I had to replace it because it was so old. The heating but is okay. It's, it's the air conditioning. Well, some of their 19, seats are in pretty bad shape. 1928, oh, yeah. well, 19, I guess it was, something like something that. that. Yeah. Right. It's still acoustically a beautiful place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, they either hear They're, the organ or bands. I've heard both in there. Uh, the the big issue with the patio is parking. Yeah. There is no parking. Right. Yeah, that's one of the whole problems with that right. area. And uh, they're, I guess they're trying to deal with the bank on there. I'm not sure what the status of that is. Well, if they can get parking in, in the bank, that would help. But yeah. the, the last time, it I believe it was Harris Bank that owned that p- property on the corner, and they right, wanted nothing to do with parking over there. Something with insurance. Something with insurance. Yeah, insurance is a yeah. big hassle. And now with the new parking meter situation in Chicago, that kind of really put the crimps mm, to it. Yeah, mm-hmm. put the crimps on there. Yeah. Although with with a little political pull up mm-hmm. and down Austin Avenue, they got rid of those meters to help out the one restaurant on the corner over there. Because otherwise, that restaurant would have probably went uh, under. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Burgundy, yeah. The Burgundy, old, yeah. yeah. Speaking yeah, about that meter years. program, <laughs> just hit a raw nerve on me. Um, the old system had your Duncan parking meters, which is right in the company right here. They had a special number to call and unit if you had what was a defective one. And mm-hmm. a couple of times, it was proper procedure. You called it, and I had it three or four times it happened. And uh, they said, yeah, send it to us. Now, the way it stands now without the meters, um, uh, it's just the whole the whole thing stunk no matter what from day one here. And thank you, Richie Daly. Uh, it's just no, because Richie got a job with the company after. Or <laughs> Do you have something to do with it? What are you doing? <laughs> did, he, <laughs> did, he, did he check the meters? Uh, well, anyway. Legal uh, help. Yeah. Uh, for years, now, Tom, you can, I think, can back me up on this one. There was a big, big deal about concealed carry in Illinois for private citizens. And it was also a big thing going in Washington about... Uh, Retired officers, uh, retired or otherwise, being able to carry the country gun throughout the country. This took years and years to get legislation. Illinois finally Illinois was the, was last, the last state to authorize the last state conce- to have right. concealed carry. Yeah. That took forever. Uh, meanwhile, I've had this problem with this rheumatoid arthritis, where I have the hook, the uh, permit for parking. You know, all of a sudden, <coughs> under the radar, I, about two years ago now. I get the notice from the Secretary of State's office that those meter, those permits will no longer be good to let you park in the meter zone. That got under the radar in no time. Mm. The other thing took years. So, is there am I missing something here, or is it what happened? What <laughs> yeah, I think they, happened? Uh, they were not making money on it, and they decided that uh, that people were cheating. Oh, and 
Now, unless no. you cannot reach the <laughs> pay box, uh, you cannot get the permanent uh, pass as such. But from my perspective, I very seldom parked at those damn things anyway. So you can get the me. permit; it just doesn't count. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean? I got I got a handicap permit, but I it, it just doesn't count because of the fact that you have to have a special tag in order to get free parking. Well, I just I just well, learned this kind of well, similar situation. The state will no longer, the Secretary of State's office no longer sends out notices reminding you when your uh, license plate sticker yeah. has expired. Hmm. It's now going to be your responsibility hmm. to keep track of that. And if you but if, of course if you don't buy the sticker, you will be ticketed, but they're no longer going to send out the form and the reminder as they've as they've done for as long as I can. Oh, remember. last last time I got a notice on the internet uh, that my I'm past due. Uh, <laughs> you know, like you look at that little sticker, and who the hell knows what's going on? You know, and uh, and the other question is, how the hell do you renew? You know, especially the older you get, the you know the more cumbersome it gets, and you don't even know where to go for that stuff. And the other, the, well, if you the call other the state thing, of Illinois, they will tell you where state, to go. With this controversy downstate. Uh, they decided that they can't afford to go and fund the notification of... Yeah, I don't know if this is a permanent or if it's just temporary because of the budget problem in the state, but it sounded to me as though it's permanent. Individual responsibility, that's, that's what I right, said. That's right, that's yeah, right. Stu stupidity is outside the law, and the fact is they don't count the legislators as far as being stupid. <laughs> With the new parking, if you go through any area like... Uh, Irving and Milwaukee, Portage Park, or Belmont and Central, any of these areas, little areas, all these mom and pop stores that were the little shopping areas. Yeah. You never see any cars anymore. Nobody spend the money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah they, they, well, the Sunday got, change made a tiny bit of help, but not much. A little bit. Just a little. A little. Yeah. Well, the problem with that was the fact that people were parked there and they parked there all day and they still wouldn't help. Fed the meters. Yeah. Yeah. You're not supposed to feed the meter. You're not supposed to stay longer than whatever. If it's a two hour meter, you're not supposed to, <laughs> supposed to stay there longer. Of course, if you. Keep your timer on. Who's going to know, right? Yeah. Jack. I know I went through all this. Well, some suburbs would chalk the tires. Mm. I'll give you a secret. One way it used to be. I don't know if they do that anymore. I'll give but you a secret, Jack. Who are they? But the other, other <laughs> stupid uh, story I heard one time, one guy was small mom pop shop. He said, I don't understand how come nobody ever comes in the store. And the guy says, uh, who's parked out there? He says, oh, that's my car out there. Hmm. <laughs> 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 Duh! <laughs> you can you can still get parking on the street with your pass, in Oak Park. Oh, they God still bless you, Oak Park. Park is Thank you, Ernest Hemingway. They still have some assigned places Thank you, Rice Bros. You can pull in there. Yeah, so John John, uh, what's his name? Maloney. He's from Oak, Oak Park too. Oh, yeah. On a positive note about that, <laughs> it sure was a hell of a lot more uh, smarter that we have these staggered months to renew with a little sticker rather than lying on the cold pavement in january changing your license plates completely every year which we did for how many That's years right until when somewhere in the 80s maybe or somewhere was that i think you're right john and that, that plus the the city vehicle license being staggered that way so you're not hit it once hmm. would, any, would anyone anyone disagree with that anyone anyone hmm? the funny story goes with that my my front plate got to be pretty bad sh sh uh, bad shape hmm. so i switched plates Mm -hmm. The front, the back, okay. and of course, they had the stickers on the front plate. That's and he got good. the cop all excited. <laughs> <laughs> then he went around the back and he said, Oh, there's a new sticker on there. Hmm. So, confused the hell out of him. Ooh. Well, one good thing about them having uh, renewal in June is that uh, it's not around Christmas time when you have other expenses to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To, uh, to, uh, well, now, to now the city's doing the same thing. They're staggering. Oh, the uh, city was doing? I mix. Yeah, yeah, because the fact that the. They decided that the line that was waiting in over at Gale Street there was about a mile long, and they couldn't get in, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And they said, hey, that's pretty smart. We ought to go and stagger it, plus the yeah. fact that it makes our finances a little more even than trying to get the sudden spike. and then You can even buy it less than a year if you just got your car. Yeah. But who wants to replace a city sticker in January? Ooh, that will be bad. <laughs> well, yeah. On that happy note, I think we're just about at the end. Mm -hmm. And I want everyone to remember, I want to thank our guests today, oh, Ron yeah. Smolin and uh, Steve Cooper. And we had a great to a great day, a great topic. <coughs> and thank you, Rich Lang, for suggesting that. That was your suggestion. 
There'll be a little bit extra in your in your <laughs> envelope thank this you. month. Hey, thank you. Yeah, and, uh, some better thank you to our, our regular uh, panel. 50% and we have several people trade. missing, <laughs> but we have uh, today Tom McKenna, Al Opitz, announcer, and, uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> from the uh, world of the uh, upper edu higher education, Rich Lang, uh, Ron Smolin, I said already, I'll yeah. see you again. <laughs> and uh, Ron Smolin, orchestra leader. Uh, uh, he was also the uh, member of the Chicago Junction. Yes. Group. And uh, what happened to your buddy? Uh, what's his name? And uh, no, John Kushelko, former no, state rep. That's correct. Recovering politician, right? I I never shied away from the term politician. <laughs> well, not a bad I word. was in politics. If do you you're know in politics, you're a politician. Until That's because you're not time, in Chicago. <laughs> Jack Ryan reminded you that history is much more than a book you keep on your shelf. Or a coffee table. And if it's Sunday, it's meet the... Now, price. here comes a legitimate announcement. Oh. <laughs> we wish to thank heaven of Jack FM, WRHS 89.7 FM, over the Ridgewood Radio Network. Recordings of previous Meet the Chicago Historians programs are available for your listening via the Internet at www.windycityhometown.com. And we want to thank the executive direct producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network, John Seconda. On behalf of everyone associated with our Historians Program, we thank you for listening. This is your announcer, Rich Lang. So long until next month. You have been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians from the John DeVita Broadcast Center on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, October the 19th, the year of our Lord, 2015. This broadcast was produced by Jack Ryan, directed by John DeVita, and a special thanks once again to the executive producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network, Mr. John Chaconda. This program was pre-recorded on Monday, October the 19th, the year 2015. Until next month, please be safe and thanks for listening.